I now declare that the Plano City Council preliminary open meeting is reconvened in open session, that all council members are present. Uh, Deputy Mayor Pro Tem Maria Tu is on Zoom. Our first item on the preliminary agenda is consideration action resulting from executive session. First item is personnel appointments and reappointments. Item A, Board of Adjustment. <clears throat> Do you want to take that or? Okay, well, there we go. Um, Council Member Smith and I have conferred we would like to uh, reappoint regular member Connor Barron uh, and um, regular member uh, Mansoor Karimi, uh, as well as alternates Karen Balesa and Jose Figueroa, uh, leaving one vacancy. Uh, so uh, I'll make that a motion. Thank you. We're going to do hand voting not only for POM, but for the regular meeting, too. We're having some technical difficulties. So <clears throat> I have a motion. Did you second that, Rick? Uh, Thank you. I'm sorry. I have a motion and a second to approve the reappointments uh, for the Board of Adjustment. All in favor? Maria, you raise your hand. Thank you, Maria. It's very good. <laughs> motion passes, 8 to 0. Building Standards Commission. <clears throat> Uh, Building Standards Commission, uh, Council Member Williams and I have conferred we would like to uh, defer uh, these reappointments to our next meeting. Okay. I don't know if I need to move. I'll make that a motion. Sure. There we go. Second. Okay. So I have a motion and a second to uh, defer or table the uh, reappointments for Building Standards Commission. All in favor? Thank you. Motion passes eight to zero. Heritage Commission. <clears throat> uh, well, I guess uh, Deputy Mayor Pro Tem Two and I have conferred, and uh, we would like to uh, reappoint Nancy Baldwin, uh, leaving three vacancies. Uh, uh, and I so move. We have two second. Thank you. I have a motion and a second to uh, reappoint Nancy Baldwin to the Heritage Commission. All in favor? Motion passes eight to zero, thank you. Planning and Zoning Commission. Council Member Horn and I have uh, spoken about this and we would like to defer uh, this until the first meeting in August. I'll make a motion to defer. Second. Thank you. I have a motion and a second to defer uh, PNC's uh, reappointments to the August 14th meeting. All in favor, raise your hand. Motion passes eight to zero. Our next item is personnel reappointments. Uh, animal shelter at an advisory committee. Mr. Mayor, on this particular advisory committee, we'd like to retain Madeline Norris on the committee and we will have two openings. Okay. Second. Right. Thank you, I have a motion and second for the reappointment of the Animal Shelter Advisory Committee. All in favor? Thank you, motion passes eight to zero. Civil Service Commission. Mayor and Council, I'd like to reappoint Penny Robe as chair. I'll make a motion to appoint Kenny Road to the Civil Service Commission. It's not even close. But what? <laughs> What's his name? Penny Road. Penny. Penny. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Penny with a P. Penny Road. Penny with a V. I'll second that. Uh, all in favor of uh, reappointing Penny Road for Civil Service Commission, please raise your hand. No, it's, it's got us moving. Motion passes eight to zero. Thank you. Community. Community Relations Commission. Um, <clears throat> so uh, Council Member Horn and I have conferred about this and uh, we would like to, uh, to defer these appointments to the first meeting in July. So uh, I will uh, move to table. August. August, oh, is that is that what we're doing? So we're not, yeah. not the July 24th? A second. Uh, 
Either way, August. That's perfect. So, August. sorry. August. <laughs> okay, to August. August. That'll August be my 14. motion. <laughs> okay, so I have a motion, a second to defer Community Relations Commission reappointments to the August 14th meeting. All in favor? Motion passes, eight to zero. Thank you. Cultural Arts Commission. Uh, Council Member Two and I have conferred on this, and we would like to defer to, uh, our decision to the August 14th meeting. Make a motion. Uh, Maria, two second. Okay. I got a motion, a second to defer the Cultural Arts Commission appointments. All in favor? Motion passes eight to zero. Thank you. Library Advisory Board. Uh, uh, Library Advisory Board, uh, I believe uh, that that may be uh, Councilmember Williams and, and myself. I'd like to defer that to uh, to the next. Uh, is it? I may, I may have that wrong. Uh, I thought uh, for Library Advisory, we were going to uh, approve all of the um, uh, reapplicants. It was um, it, it was uh, building standards that we were going to defer. Yes. Yes. You're, you're right. Thank you. I'm sorry. I've got so many pieces of paper here. I uh, lost, lost something in the shuffle, but <laughs> in any event, okay, let me take a shot at this. Um, uh, we would like to uh, uh, reappoint uh, Jessica Bartnick, Yu Dong, Adam Griffith, and uh, Carol Sewell, uh, leaving one opening. Okay. And I'll make that a motion. Second. I have a motion and a second to reappoint... Uh, Bartnick, Dong, Griffith, and Sewell. Is that, did I, am I right on? No. Yes. Yes. All in favor, please raise your hand. Motion. Motion passes eight to zero. I'm, I'm I'm so sorry. The city manager has just pointed something out as I as I was uh, shuffling those papers oh. around. I accidentally read off a name in there that is not requesting reappointment. Okay. I guess I I will move to modify. Yeah. Uh, the motion that we just uh, passed, I guess, uh, so that we are reappointing Jessica Bartnick, Adam Griffith, and Carol Sewell, leaving two openings. Uh, and my apologies for the uh, for the mistake. Second it a second time. <laughs> okay. I have a motion and second to amend the uh, the motion for Bartnick, Griffith, and Sewell. Is that right? Okay. All in favor? Motion passes eight to zero. Thank you. Parks and Rec Planning Board. Uh, Mr. Mayor, we want to uh, retain uh, Justin Adcock, Brian Shoppett, and Hayden Pageant, and we have two openings for this. Board. Okay. I'll second that. Thank you. I have a motion and a second to approve Adcock, Shaput, and Pageant. All in favor? Raise your hand. Motion passes eight to zero. Thank you. Plano Housing Authority, I will defer those until August 14th. I make a motion. Second. Thank you. <laughs> I have a motion and a second to defer Plano Housing Authority until August 14th. All in favor? Thank you. Motion passes. Plano Improvement Corporation. I'd, I'd like to uh, reappoint Jack Carr, Deputy City Manager, uh, as the council appointed director. Second. Thank you. I have a motion and a second uh, to uh, reappoint Jack Carr in the uh, Plano Improvement Corporation. All in favor? Thank you. Motion passes eight to zero. Retirement Security Plan Committee. Mayor and Council, I'd like to defer uh, action on this until the August 14th meeting. Okay. Senior Advisory Board. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Council Member uh, Orr and I have uh, conferred on this, and we will be reappointing uh, Sherry uh, Scramardo. And we have uh, three members that uh, are re requested not to be reappointed. That would be uh, Bolin, Greisdorf, and Rommel. So okay. that will leave us with three openings. Okay. And I'll make that a motion. I'll second. 
Okay, so I have a uh, motion and a second for the Senior Advisory Board reappointment for Sherry Scarmato. All in favor? Motion passes eight to zero. Tax increment financing and reinvestment zone number two and three boards. Smith and Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Councilmember Williams and I have conferred, and uh, we will be, uh, uh, let's see, reappointing uh, uh, the Chair, uh, Corey Ronecker, and Member Jason Tyra, and with, uh, let's see, Liz Lansing and Tracy McDaniel. And that will leave us with uh, four vacancies on this uh, board. And I make that a motion. Second. Okay. So I have a motion and a second to reappoint the tax increment financing reinvestment zone number two and three board for the four people that you just mentioned. All in favor? Motion passes eight to zero. Thank you. We have just enough time to get to the emergency management report by <laughs> Carrie Little. No pressure, Carrie, I'm sorry. Thank you so much <laughs> for, I, I'm very excited to be here. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, so we will go through this quickly because I know we are in a time crunch. I am here tonight to give y'all a very brief update about what we have been up to um, in our emergency management office in 2022 and a little snippet about what we've been up to this year. So we have a brief mission statement, a brief but lofty mission statement for our office. Um, the mission of the Emergency Management Office is to restore community safety and confidence by bringing order to the chaos following disaster. So we do that in a variety of ways. We are fortunate to have a relatively large emergency management staff. We are funded for nine positions. Two of those are part-time positions. Um, although I have asked for one of those part-time positions to become a full-time position because of changes to workload and some of um, the expectations that have come to our office and, and changes in some of the requirements for our office, especially post-COVID. Uh, we organize our functions around three main themes to develop readiness, to coordinate response, and to expedite recovery. And we're gonna talk about all of these very, very briefly. Um, very quickly, our 2022 year in review, and that is very small, so I do apologize for those of you in the audience, but we'll talk about some of these um, <clears throat> briefly, at the beginning of 2022, our um, friends in the fire department, fire training, was co-located in our office. Our office was actually designed to house um, 10 staff members. We had 16 in our office, which meant um, we were doubled up. We were using conference rooms as offices, and we had two people um, in offices, and um, so we were snug in our little office. But January, we started with our EOC hosting the first out of 63 um, outside trainings and meetings. In February, we resumed classes for our Boy Scouts. We offered seven class classes over the years, but um, we offer a class where the Scouts actually get the majority, the bulk of the, their requirements for their emergency preparedness badge. We also published the Winter Storm URI After Action Report. For the month of April, every Monday and Wednesday, we worked to run all of our um, police, fire, emergency management personnel through active shooter drills. We had gone to a training in October of 2021 where the active law enforcement rapid response training out of San Marcos um, actually had done a study showing that the most hazardous, um, uh, hazardous responses for our police and fire personnel were actually outdoor events um, during active shooter events. So we conducted a drill at the Red Tail Pavilion and ran every police and um, firefighter through that drill. In May, we kicked off our hazard mitigation action plan meeting. You'll see that later on. Um, we're bringing that plan to you for adoption. 
Uh, in June of 2022, we had the HMAP, or the HMAP Citizen and Interested Party Survey go out. In July, we had um, some upgrades to our EOC to allow video teleconferencing in all of our rooms. We had done a large upgrade in, um, in 2017 and 2018. It did not allow video teleconferencing in every single room. We realized during COVID that was a mistake and we needed to correct that. In September, we brought our comprehensive emergency management plan to council for adoption. In September, we also submitted our hazard mitigation action plan to TDEM for the initial review. So our initial review went to TDEM in September. It's June. We're finally bringing it to y'all for adoption before sending it back to TDEM and FEMA for final approval. Uh, in October, we hosted some additional classes and training. And then in November, we um, hosted training for the Texas Highway Patrol, that was unique for us. That was the first time we had hosted training. We hosted four classes for them. We had 50 troopers in our building. Um, so that was kind of fun. Overall, like I mentioned, we had 63 trainings in our building for um, outside departments and agencies. Fire training moved out of our building in September. I know um, Chief Biggerstaff talked to you about how excited he was. We love our fire friends. Um, we were also equally excited um, that they moved out and that we went back to um, using our building just for emergency management because we had a lot of training that we did. Uh, we also hosted uh, about 15 outside agencies for tours of our building. We use AV in a unique way in our EOC, and so a lot of people come to see how that um, is used. Underdeveloped readiness. Social media has been a um, very big tool for us. These are a couple of the more funny and popular social media tools, or social media posts. Um, one is how we explain a watch versus a warning. Um, one is trying to explain that we have outdoor warning sirens and not just tornado sirens. And then one was during the winter storm. Um, inside, it's warm and cozy. Outside, it's really ugly. There could be bears. We don't know. Um, but we have seen a huge increase, um, hundreds, percent increase in both Twitter and Facebook since we have um, taken a more humorous approach to that. Community contact hours in 2022, we were just coming back um, and things were becoming more normal. We, we were at 20, we did 26 different presentations and festivals and events. There was a total of 115 contact hours in 2023. We've already done 30 events for 100 contact hours. That's not total hours. Um, that's how long, as in that's not total hours of staff, that's just um, how long each of the events when you add them up were. Um, I have a very short video that we're going to play about CERT. Oops, maybe not. We teach people confidence. The confidence that should a situation arise, that you have the capabilities to react to that situation. It's really empowering to know that you're what's going to be there first, you're what's going to comfort the people. Our volunteers are made up of really everyone. They are some of the most amazing people that you'll ever meet. They're all different, and they all want to be part of our CERT program for many different reasons. Everybody brings a skill. That's the beauty of CERT. So we have a CERT program, it's, um, and it started again in the fall, of, that should be 2022, um, but we started that back up again. It, previously, in the fall of 2022, it was an eight-week course. We've shortened it to where it's a three-day course. It's a weekend course. That was a wildly popular offering, um, but we've trained over 300 people um, in CERT um, since its inception here in Plano. As I mentioned, we started the Scout Emergency Preparedness Badge uh, basics back up. Last year, we offered seven courses and trained over um, 100 scouts. This year, we've off already offered three courses and trained about um, 60 scouts. We've done a lot of planning. Last year, we updated our comprehensive emergency management plan. We've done an extensive rewrite to our hazard mitigation action plan. We developed facility emergency plans, um, and then we've done an update to our active threat um, program guidance. While we've led these efforts, these efforts are um, 
truly group efforts. We deal with all of our city departments um, in this process. We're coordinating the efforts, working with all of our different um, departments and outside agencies. For our Homeland Security Grant Administration, over the last 10 years, we've managed um, about $2.5 million worth of grants. We use these grants to equip primarily our police and fire um, specialized units with um, equipment. We coordinate response through different training. Last year, we offered training on some incident management software, some of our NIMS training, various uh, emergency management programs. This year, we're um, rolling out our facility emergency plans. We're conducting some training, bringing some outside agencies in to help us with that. Upcoming, we're doing an emergency management uh, academy, helping people become familiar with their roles in the EOC, and then also offering training on um, our, our instant management tool within the EOC that's uh, called Web EOC. We participate in exercises. We conduct drills and participate in drills with city departments and outside agencies. We conduct that large active threat exercise with our police, fire, and dispatch. Um, departments every other year. And then um, this November, we'll be going up to Emmitsburg to the National Emergency Management Training Academy to do a week-long drill as well. Um, we do weather warnings, and um, I just wanted to mention this briefly. We monitor weather. My staff does. It's how we determine whether or not we need to um, uh, sound the outdoor morning sirens. In 2022, there were 24 different um, days that we had to watch storms. Um, in 2023, we've had a banner year. There, are, there have already been 21 days where we had to watch storms. Um, and saying that we have to watch storms, that is um, storms that come through in the middle of the night. Um, there are some days where we might be watching a storm at, th at 3 o'clock in the morning and then um, again at 10 p.m. that night just because of the way the weather is setting up. I could not give a presentation without mentioning our outdoor warning sirens. We have 43 sirens. They sound for four reasons. One, we have a confirmed tornado in the city of Plano. Two, we have a tornado warning that is naming Plano. Three, we have a hail that is an inch and a half or greater. Or four, we have a warning with the criteria of destructive winds 70 miles per hour or greater. However, the sirens only mean one thing, and that is to go inside and get more information. That's all they mean, just one thing. Um, we expedite recovery by assisting with the reimbursement process. Some numbers real quick, COVID emergency assistance, we had approximately $1.6 million worth of funding that has been reimbursed, that we submitted for and was reimbursed, that was from COVID. We have approximately $1.4 million that has been reimbursed from the COVID vaccination clinics that were run, another almost half a million dollars that is still pending review. And then from Winter Storm Uri, there was um, a little under or a little over $200,000 that was submitted for and that has been reimbursed. Uh, for mitigation, our hazard mitigation action plan will come up um, for uh, adoption uh, later on today. And then there are hazard mitigation grant programs that will be open up now that our hazard mitigation, or once our hazard mitigation action plan receives final approval from both TDEM and FEMA and those are pre-disaster mitigation um, grant funds, a hazard mitigation grant program, and then a flood mitigation assistance and a building resilient infrastructure and community grant or BRIC grant. I stayed within my time. <laughs> you did very good. So, um, that was a very brief overview of what we have been doing. Um, if you have questions, please feel free to ask me um, or I can answer them. But we'll gather any questions and circle back with you, Carrie, but I perfect. think everybody will get a, a much deeper understanding in November. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We, um, 
we're going to, I'm going to come back to you, Andrew, when we uh, start the regular meeting, but I do want to go ahead and get the consent and regular agendas uh, taken care of. Any item uh, someone wants to pull a uh, consent agenda? The uh, items for future agendas? Okay. We will start the regular meeting. I now declare the Plano City Council is reconvened in open session, that all members are present. Uh, Maria Tu, Deputy Mayor Pro Tem Maria Tu, is on Zoom. We'll begin tonight's regular meeting with the invocation led by Josh Connor, Associate Pastor of the Parkway Hills Baptist, and the Pledge of Allegiance and Texas Pledge led by the Girl Scout Ambassador Troop 3460 with Plano Senior High. Would you please rise? Would you pray with me? Almighty God, we thank you so much for the eight members of this team that lead our city. We thank you that now for 150 years you have blessed this city with men and women who have been granted wisdom to lead forward and to lead this to be a city of excellence. God, as we meet tonight and speak of very important things in the life of the city of Plano, would you grant wisdom to our mayor, to our city council, to their teams who support them, that we might continue to seek the welfare of this city and to see its prosperity. We thank you so much for the gift of your mercy, and we pray that it would go out to all the people who live in this great city. We pray all these things for Jesus' sake. Amen. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God, one indivisible. Be seated. Come on, you can do this. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for doing this. We appreciate it. Yeah. Josh, come on down. I want to take a picture with you if you don't mind. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate the part. Thanks for coming. You yeah. bet. Thank you. Appreciate it. So I have the the honor of reading a proclamation. July is Parks and Recreation Month. As long as we can stand the heat, it's a great <laughs> month. I'd like to call forward Ron Smith, Director of Parks and Rec, Renee Jordan, Park Planning Manager, Susie Hergenrader, Recreation Services Manager, Dave Angelis, Park Services Manager, and Kelly Crimmins, PR Community Outreach, uh, Outreach Specialist. So it's my honor to read this proclamation because I, I don't think there's a time when I'm out and about in Plano or wherever I am bragging about Plano. Most of the time I'm talking about parks and recs because we have been honored throughout the country and the state for being such a great place. And our parks are number one in Texas 
and right at the top in the United States. We have 85 parks. We probably have more than that now, but I'm going to go with 85. And all of those parks and the recreation centers that we have are within walking distance to our entire community, which makes it such a wonderful asset to have the parks and recreation here in Plano that was planned years and years ago. And now we, quite frankly, receive the benefits of all the parks that we have in Plano. So with, with that, it's my honor to read this proclamation. Whereas every time since 19, every year since 1985, July has been recognized as National Parks and Recreation Month. With the U.S. House of Representatives passing an official resolution in 2009, whereas Plano Parks and Recreation ranks number one in the great state of Texas, number 16 in the U.S. in the 2023 Trust for Public Land Annual Park Scores, whereas additional remarkable accolades include being the name the National Accredited Agency, a four-time National Gold Medal Award for Parks and Recreation Excellence, as well as a finalist for the 2023 Gold Medal Award. Whereas for over 50 years, under the guidance of visionary leaders, the Plano Parks and Rec Department has exceeded expectations by delivering incomparable programs and services to our re residents throughout a robust park system consisting of more than 4,300 acres with 85 parks, I was close, <laughs> and 90 miles of trails, nine swimming pools, five rec centers, to which nearly 80% of our Plano residents live within a 10-minute walk. From that has been achieved. Now, therefore, I, John Munns, Mayor of the City of Plano, Texas, do thereby Proclaim July 2023 as Parks and Recreation Month in Plano. And I do thereby encourage all citizens to join me and the Plano City Council in acknowledging the importance of our parks and recreation system in promoting Plano's unparalleled quality of life. We commend the Parks and Recreation Department for their dedication and welcome everyone in Plano and beyond to visit the highest ranking park system in the great state of Texas. Congratulations. Mayor Munns, thank you very much for reading this proclamation. And I wanna thank all of you. Thank you so much for coming out tonight for this special proclamation. That means a lot to us. Thank you. Uh, I would just like to say that we invite all of you, all residents of Plano, join with your fellow residents the tens of thousands that will benefit from parks and recreation this summer and in the month of July. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. We got to get centered. We got to get centered. Oh, yeah. There we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have never heard that. You're great. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you, guys. You bet. Always a pleasure. I'd like to go back to Andrew Fortune, our government governor government affairs director, to give us. Uh, a little information regarding the legislative session. Well, good evening, Mayor and Council. Andrew Fortune, Director of Policy and Government Affairs for the City of Plano. Um, I wanted to uh, briefly go over this legislative update, but uh, with the caveat that if you have specific questions uh, to a, a specific bill, I'd be happy to visit with you offline, um, and we can uh, gather questions maybe at the end for the sake of time, um, and I can happily provide a response. So just some uh, brief statistics uh, to start out with. This was uh, certainly a record session for many different reasons, but uh, the volume of bills uh, certainly uh, was extremely high. We tracked uh, um, over 1,200 bills 
uh, or th over 1,300 bills, apologies, um, with 149 um, that actually passed this session. So a lot for us to still uh, digest and work with our legal department to ensure that we're in full compliance. Um, just uh, quick highlights, property tax relief is still uh, the discussion that's going on. You've probably seen the news and seen snippets, but um, right now there's disagreement between the Senate and the House and the governor on how to pr deliver property tax relief. Um, I think all Texans are excited for whatever that final package will be, uh, but we're going to continue to see that. We have heard that a special session will be called this Wednesday um, to once again take up this issue. Uh, school vouchers did fail to pass, but we are also expecting another special session called by the governor to address that issue as well, although we do not anticipate votes um, to advance that at this time. Um, as many of y'all may remember, we uh, did choose to reopen our legislative program and add um, the value of transit um, service report um, and reporting and auditing uh, to our legislative agenda. And so um, House Bill 3146 and its companion in the Senate um, did advance through the Senate, but unfortunately died um, in the House. Uh, and so we do have ongoing efforts to produce this report uh, with DART, um, and a lot of the discussion is hung up around the methodology. And so I uh, will provide updates uh, as they become relevant. I do want to thank uh, certainly Mayor and, and Councilmember Williams for all of your ongoing efforts on this particular project down in Austin. Uh, public facility corporations. Uh, House Bill 2071, uh, you all may have received already a briefing um, on this. Uh, this is just a high level overview. It does change um, how public facility corporations can be done in the state of Texas. Um, it does take immediate effect. It received uh, the supermajority necessary for that. We did have two bills, uh, House Bill 2964 and 2966. Uh, that really sought to make some of these changes, we were able to collapse those into this bill. Um, one major component uh, that's new will be an audit that will be required annually. House Bill 2127, uh, that's been on everyone's mind. Um, I'm afraid I don't have too many more details on that, but I did want to provide this overview just to show you the areas in the code that are impacted uh, with this bill because of its broad nature and the, the way it's been written. Um, we do expect a lot of litigation, and really we won't know the true impact until we see some of that. Um, thankfully for cities, there was negotiated a three-month window, um, so if a city's regulation is going to be challenged, the city will have three months to make adjustments, um, if appropriate. Uh, just a, a quick list of the things that were expressly protected, um, things like payday lending ordinances that were already in place, um, uh, some public awareness campaign events, Again, I'll provide this presentation for y'all so y'all can dig into it a little bit more. Short-term rentals, uh, if you remember, we brought these this slide uh, before you at a former council meeting. The first two bills that are listed uh, did die in the process. Senate Bill 929 has reshaped the landscape for short-term rentals and some of the impacts that cities are now going to face uh, dealing with short-term rental regulation, et cetera. Um, House Bill 2127, again, um, some of that super preemption may have some uh, you know, additional impacts. We're, we're still working through that and to see kind of how that works. Um, Senate Bill 929, again, just a, a reminder, um, an STR ban uh, would create non-conforming uses triggering elements of this bill. And so uh, we are working with our legal department to uh, you know, uh, revise things given this current landscape. Um, HB 3699 was a platting bill. Um, it was uh, negotiated to where uh, plans were not included in the 30-day shot clock uh, for plats. Um, the city is also able to delegate that plat uh, review to staff um, for the sake of efficiency. Um, other elements of the bill are listed there. Uh, again, I'm happy to go through. Um, and really, the, re the remaining slides are just uh, some of the bills that have passed and will become law in September. Um, I won't I belabor that for the sake of time. Again, I'll, there are probably 10 or so slides of this, so if you'd like some light reading for your evening, um, I'll be up and available if you have questions. So. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Williams. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mayor and Council, uh, I'd like to recognize Andrew Fortune's efforts this legislative session. Um, under the Texas Constitution, the Texas legislature meets uh, biennially, once every two years for five months. Uh, this is to limit the amount of damage they can do, unlike in Washington, where they never leave and they're always causing damage. Um, but because it's five months every two years, at least for regular sessions, uh, it's intense. Um, I have had to uh, wait until after 3 a.m. personally to testify in committees before uh, during the session. Um, this was my first real opportunity to uh, 
worked closely with Andrew um, as we were both at the Capitol, he far more than I, um, <clears throat> but uh, he did an exemplary job uh, navigating the, um, uh, the ins and outs of the Capitol, um, working with legislative staff, uh, keeping us uh, up to date on what was happening in various committees. Uh, we won some, we lost some, we laughed, we cried, um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but he did an outstanding job and I wanted to publicly recognize him for that. Thank you, appreciate that, sir. And thank you, Andrew. Uh, and I will skip through this so we get back to... Thank you, Andrew. Yes, sir, absolutely. Let's move on to comments and public interest. <clears throat> Comments of public interest. This portion of the meeting is to allow up to three minutes per speaker with 30 total minutes on items of interest or concern and not on items that are on the current agenda. The council may not discuss these items but may respond with factual or policy information. The council may choose to place the item on a future agenda. And I do have two speakers this evening. The first one is James Russell. James Russell. Then we will move on to Sharon Overall. Secondhand smoke and the infringement of your rights. Per the EPA, is outdoor exposure to secondhand smoke comparable to indoors? Whether the exposure occurs indoors or outdoors, the adverse health effects remain the same. The only difference is that indoors, the concentration of the harmful chemicals, compounds, and particles is kept in and doesn't go away as quickly as outdoors. Is outdoor exposure to secondhand smoke in public venues such as parks harmful to children? Regardless of where the exposure takes place, outside or inside, secondhand smoke poses health risks to children. The U.S. Surgeon General has found that there is no safe level of exposure. Per the CDC, there is no safe level of exposure to secondhand smoke. Even brief exposure can cause serious health effects. Per the Canadian Middlesex London Health Unit, there is no safe level of secondhand smoke inside or outside. Secondhand smoke, whether inside or outside, is particularly dangerous to children as they are all still growing and developing and exposure to it can lead to many health effects. Outdoor levels of tobacco smoke can be as high as indoors. If there is no wind, tobacco smoke will rise and fall and flood the local area with secondhand smoke. If there is a breeze, tobacco smoke will spread in many directions. Minimizing the risk of secondhand smoke outdoors. Refrain from using tobacco products around your children outdoors and advise others to move away from crowds. Avoid places where you and your family might be exposed to secondhand smoke outdoors. A study conducted at one of the University of Maryland campuses, anyone positioned downwind from an outdoor source of secondhand smoke will be exposed even at significant distances from the source. For a study in California, the secondhand smoke can travel up to 100 feet from the smoker with wind, and it can linger in the air for up to five hours. The California Air Resource Board measured secondhand smoke concentrations in a variety of outdoor locations at airports, colleges, office complexes, and amusement parks. They found that when smoking occurs in these settings, people could be exposed to levels of secondhand smoke that is comparable to indoor concentrations where smoking is permitted. In another study where measurements were conducted when active smoking was taking place at outdoor patios, sidewalks, and parks, similar seconds. results were observed. So your kids are playing in your backyard and your neighbor is outside smoking 15 feet from the fence. Do you make your children come inside? How long do they have to stay inside since it can linger for five hours? Whose rights? are being infringed upon. Thank you. Thank you. Consent agenda, please. The consent agenda. The consent agenda will be acted upon in one motion and contains items which are routine and typically non-controversial. Items may be removed from this agenda for individual discussion by a council member, the city manager, or any citizen. The presiding officer will establish time limits based upon the number of speaker requests. Motion to approve. 
Second. second. Thank you. I have a motion and a second. We're going to have to hand vote, so everybody remember that. I have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. All in favor, please raise your hand. Motion passes eight to zero. Thank you. Public hearing items. Applicants are limited to 15 minutes presentation time with a five minute rebuttal if needed. Remaining speakers are limited to 30 total minutes of testimony time with three minutes assigned per speaker. The presiding officer may amend these times as deemed necessary. Non-public hearing items. The presiding officer will permit public comment for items on the agenda not posted for a public hearing. The presiding officer will establish time limits based upon the number of speaker requests, length of the agenda, and to ensure meeting efficiency, and may include a cumulative time limit. Speakers will be called in the order the requests were received until the cumulative time is exhausted. Item number one, consideration of an ordinance to amend chapter six, buildings and building regulations of the code of ordinances of the city of Plano by adding article 24, registration of short-term rental properties, providing for procedures for the registration and self-inspections of short-term rental for operation, providing for procedures for approval, denial, suspension, and revocation of registration of short-term rentals and providing a penalty clause, a severability clause, a repealer clause, a savings clause, a publication clause, and an effective date. Thank you. Considering uh, the information that we've received uh, over the last few days and in through an executive session regarding Senate Bill 929 and other information that we're still trying to collect, uh, we, we are uh, needing to table this item. And I was wanting to know if uh, we had a motion to do that. I'll make a motion to, to August 14th. August 14th. I have a motion and a second. Second. Okay. Well, yeah, okay. We had, we had. Was, was that, we, <laughs> you were seeking one. Okay. All in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, motion passes eight to zero. I still uh, know that uh, you signed up to, to speak and be glad to hear you. I'd like to limit it to one minute, uh, being that we're going to talk about it on August 14th. So go ahead and let's uh, hear the speakers. The first speaker is Lynn McClemon, followed by Elena Bork. This is going to be really hard to do in one minute. I'm Lynn McClyman. I've lived in Plano for 27 years in the same single family resident neighborhood. There's a short term rental, three houses down from me. I was here to talk about tabling the registration um, that you've already tabled, so I got to skip here. Um, I guess really what I want to say is that. Um, in the community survey that you guys conducted, the number one complaint was parking. And I hope you don't ignore that that was the number one complaint. The city of Dallas handled it by making it mandatory for all short-term rentals to provide the number of off-street parking places per number of bedrooms, dens, game rooms, et cetera, wherever there was a bed. I think that parking is really important for you to address in registration, and so I hope that you do that. Um, I'm sorry, but that was kind of convoluted. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Elena Burke, and I've lived in my Plano home for 30 years. I am very pleased that you are tabling this tonight. Um, would love to know what happened between last month and the um, temporary ban and what we saw uh, released last week, but that's for another time. Based on your own survey results, the vast majority of Plano homeowners do not want a short-term rental next to them. For all the many reasons that have been explained in this chamber for over a year now, city councils should protect the quality of life and the existence of safe neighborhoods. To quote a Dallas City Councilwoman, we have a situation in which the profit of some debits the peace of many. 
SDRs are incompatible with residential zoning, and they also exacerbate critical housing shortages. 15 seconds. Are you going to allow the threat of a potential lawsuit to prevent you from doing the right thing? The city of Dallas is not. This sets a dangerous precedent if we do. Thank you. The next speaker is Greg Patillo, followed by Cindy Patillo. Try to do this quickly. Um, good evening, Mayor and Council, um, resident for Greg Patillo, resident business owner for more than 29 years. July 25th, 2022, almost a year ago, I stood at this dais for the first time. A series of presentations mostly focused on the business case, data, and economic analysis that evaluated against the oft-use measuring stick of it's the economy stupid for Plano. The short-term rental industry is an economic loser. 13 times between this body, PNZ, PISD school board. And while I've mostly been driven by the fact that I wanted to contribute in some meaningful way to making decisions regarding short-term rentals that offer the best possible outcomes for our residents, school district, and small businesses, it should not come as a surprise that there's also a business case with numbers and math that justify my continued seconds. efforts. Given the ordinance proposed tonight, I think now is a good time to share that case with you. You see, it is our plan to stay in Plano in our home for another 10 years. For Cindy and I, with the STR behind our house where the pool and hot tub is less than 50 feet away from our bedroom window, that means that the next 520 weeks of our lives, we will experience the unease that comes with not knowing who or how many people will be there or what their activities will be, their conflict resolution skills, or whether they're armed. 520 weekends where it may be necessary to contact the police or neighborhood services to temporarily restore our peace and quality of life. Mr. For the Patea, weekends we do decide. Greg, <clears throat> could you wrap it up? All right, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, I just, just wanted to know that think about your next 520 weekends and what that means to you. I know what mine are going to be like. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. We are very pleased that you are tabling this ordinance. There are three points that were of concern. One is that there was no longer a limited registration window for the existing STRs that remained. So we're concerned that someone that operated an STR prior to May of this year could come back into service at any time. Um, the proposal indicated that registration expires upon a change of ownership but there was nothing indicating that a new owner was prevent prevented from then registering that property again as an STR as the original proposal indicated. Most significantly, the new proposal includes the word revocation no fewer than 20 times. However, there is not a single circumstance in this proposal where revocation is a possible outcome. Not one. 15 seconds. A brothel, a shootout, the death of a teenager at a party, None of these can result in permanent revocation of registration, according to the current proposal. So we hope you'll consider those items as you look forward to August 14th. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Mark Pulliam, followed by Corey Reinecker. Thank you, City Council. Mark Pulliam. I'm a resident for around 30 years. I don't remember exactly. I should have done my math. The ordinance that was tabled tonight, thank you for tabling it, uh, is very different than what you had last May. And I just want to ask the council just to think about who is instructing the staff or is the staff instructing you on rewriting the ordinance? Because this ordinance is so vastly different than what was discussed and what was tabled for legislative reasons, not for practical reasons. Please consider that as you review the next session version of this ordinance when it comes back in August because I don't know who's directing the ship on this because it seems to be totally different. I mean, we've had other people mention the seconds. issues. There's a lot of issues that are vastly changed from May to now and I think we need to ask why. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Mayor and Council, thank you for the opportunity. 
here again to uh, represent the lone host perspective. Um, again, just want to emphasize that I feel that there's a lot of elements of regulation that are part of this registration program, and we still haven't done the research and the task force and all these pieces that are supposed to inform how short-term rentals are, are regulated. Um, I'm concerned about the potential privacy issues around photographs. There's news today about uh, data breach in Fort Worth and photographs and city records being leaked online. I really don't like the idea of personal thorough documentation of my house being leaked, you know, without any of my control online. Um, and the insurance policy, again, is a concern for me. And last, the, seconds. The, the fact that there's still no differentiation between um, owner-occupied and non-owner-occupied rentals, which is something that other cities have done, which would be easy to do and would acknowledge the differences in the risk associated with the types. And in the, I don't want to speak for the group, but in the conversations I've had with a few uh, neighborhood coalition members, they've said that that sort of rental doesn't bother them. Thank you. Thank you. It's moving on to item two. Item number two, public hearing and consideration <coughs> of appeals of the Planning and Zoning Commission's denials of zoning case 2022-9 dash nine and concept plan 2022 dash eight request to rezone 19.1 acres of land located at the southwest corner of Plano Parkway and Executive Drive from corridor commercial to plan development corridor commercial. The purpose of this request is to allow mid-rise units, residential units and single family residents attached units as permitted uses and to modify development standards, which may include, but are not limited to, location and size of residential uses, building setbacks, maximum floor ratio area, open space, landscape requirements, building design, parking, and other development standards. Zoned corridor commercial and located within the 190 Tollway Plano Parkway Overlay District. Good evening, Mayor and Council and Executives. I am Christina Day, the Director of Planning, and here to talk to you a little bit about uh, this zoning case, which is a request for a plan development district. Um, the current zoning of this property is corridor commercial. It's uh, developed with a large retail facility that is currently vacant. Um, and as you can see, it is located uh, generally at the intersection of uh, President George Bush Tollway and US Highway 75 with access primarily from Plano Parkway. This is a aerial shot of the property and you can see the building as it exists today, surrounded by parking in a very traditional sort of uh, big box retail style of development. So we've done these graphics to help show the difference in phasing uh, that's committed to as part of this plan development proposal. So the applicant has uh, committed to open space and some berming uh, on the south side of the property, as well as 33 single family attached units and 260 multifamily units as part of phase one. Um, Beyond that, uh, to get to phase two, you'll see there are an additional 241 units allowed. Um, and then the open space remains as is, as well as the single family attached. Um, the addition of office and hotel um, are required, or at least 70,000 square feet of non-residential development is required prior to building that second phase of multifamily development. So the zoning history, um, this was a little unique staff report because there were lots of underlining. And the reason behind that is because this was tabled at the Planning and Zoning Commission on March 1st. Um, another brief table was requested on April 17th in order to make some changes after they initially heard the case on March 1st. So the underlined portions really represent the changes that the applicant made between March 1st and May 1st. And, uh, the idea there was addressing the commission who expressed some concerns regarding phasing and noise mitigation standards. So um, the property with relation to the comprehensive plan is in the expressway corridors uh, 
designation on a future land use map. It is entirely within that singular designation. And here is our summary of how it uh, complies with the comprehensive plan. You can see there are a number of areas where it is in compliance, the mix of uses, character defining elements, uh, the remaining maps with the exception of the expressway corridor environmental health map. Um, also the transit oriented development policy is in the favor of this request. Uh, there are a few that we found neutral. Um, there's the description and priorities, downtown vision and strategy update, as well as action eight, where there were just sort of a mixed review of those policies. And then uh, there were concerns found related to expressway corridor and bottom health map, uh, the redevelopment of regional transportation corridors policy, and redevelopment and growth management policies uh, 5A and B. So with regard to mid-rise residential, uh, that is on the northern side of the property, getting the units as far away as uh, practical with relationship to this development um, from the expressway and the related noise. Um, the remaining adjacent properties are zoned corridor commercial, which allows vehicle-related uses, so that, there's some caution there. Um, so the also purpose behind the environmental health uh, map was originally because Plano had a 1,200-foot setback from the expressways, and this was to help us find a rational way of, of uh, looking at changes or challenges to that 1,200 feet because there were potentially exceptions made within the policy and this was putting a rational basis behind when should exceptions be made. So that's the purpose there. We also wanted to note that at the time the staff report was published, there were 2,600 multifamily units um, being developed in the area the majority of those at Collin Creek, a few remain at Heritage Creek side, and since that time, there have been an additional 325 units approved um, across the DART rail at J Place. Regarding single family residents attached, this does provide an opportunity for some single family houses. Those are on individually platted lots as proposed. Um, so this does align with the mix of uses of the comprehensive plan and was a change from some previous proposals. Um, so the design here is something that we've noted. It is adjacent to uh, mid-rise residential buildings, um, but they are three-story units to try to blend that height. Um, but they are just, a, it is a single row of development that um, we've talked through extensively and uh, this is the resulting proposal. The walking distance to the Bush Station is uh, 2,200 feet. Um, this is considered transit-oriented development. There are sidewalks that can get you there along Executive and the 190 service road. Um, this is what the environmental health map looks like. You can see why the residential is pushed to the north because that is in the area that um, is more favorable to mitigation. And the plan development district does propose a number of mitigation measures for um, noise and um, requires a sound engineer to look at those units. The mitigation for phase one includes berms and landscaping along the southern edge because uh, the intent is not to build um, the commercial development until the market is ready for that. So with that being the case, uh, we've asked for this additional change to the site in the time being so that there is some protection for the uh, homes and multifamily units. Uh, so you can see that in the future, there is mitigation from the south through development of those buildings. Um, 
depending on their height. And I think the noise study showed that because of the elevation of the freeway, it was difficult to get something tall enough to really mitigate much in this location, but those are there to help provide some buffer and protection for the residential uses. Uh, the plan development stipulations are divided into two tracks. You'll see references to track one and two. Um, the right-of-way is separated uh, out of those tracks, and so that's represented on the screen as a point of reference. So a summary of the PD stipulation. This is a rather lengthy plan development district. Um, so just to summarize, there is uh, one and a half acres of open space proposed. Uh, they are restricting the uses in track one. So to help ensure quality of life within the plan development district, because there will be residential there if it is approved. Phase one includes, again, we've seen this 260 mid-rise, 33 single family attached, and the required open space in Birming. Phase two requires a certificate of occupancy to be issued for 70,000 square feet of non-residential uses and um, that would allow an additional 241 mid-rise residential units. Other standards include a setback from the frontage road, noise mitigation, again related to the environmental health map, uh, townhomes per UMU district standards, so a very urban dense style townhousing product, um, height restrictions, use restrictions, as well as various regulatory standards that help uh, implement the plan that you see before you, um, in the packet that is, not, not on the screen right now. Additional standards include adjustments to setbacks and landscape edges. Um, there is a reduced edge because this is an overlay district that requires larger landscape edges. Um, also just due to the narrow nature of the property, um, a reduced landscape edge in some areas is appropriate. Also, there are design standards and it does require a governance association. So with that, um, we have favorable responses from three adjacent owners. Um, that results in 12 acres of property in the buffer and uh, almost half of the acreage within the 200 foot notice area. So there was no opposition in this area. Uh, citywide, we had a total of 39 unduplicated responses, 10 in support, one neutral, and 28 in opposition. So requested changes uh, in summary are updating the sound mitigation and phasing to recognize the proximity of the highway relative to a proposal for residential uses. Um, that does limit the number of units and uh, propose modified development standards uh, that are related to the site itself. Uh, it would aid the city's goal of redevelopment in the 75 corridor. It's a vacant building um, and meets some standards of the comprehensive plan, such as the mix of uses. However, there were challenges with this proposal related to the phasing. Um, specifically guidance on redevelopment and growth management in the comprehensive plan um, that are frankly more challenging. Uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission uh, did vote to deny this case by a vote of four to three. And that is the end of my presentation. I am available for questions. Any, any questions for staff, Mayor Pro Tem? You can go. Do you know how long this um, retail location has been vacant? I do not know that immediately. That may be a great question for the applicant. Okay. You mentioned several times in the report that um, you've, based on the comprehensive plan, you felt that it was ideal for it to stay um, open for future economic development opportunities. Can you go back to I don't know what slide it was, but it had the checks, the X's, the long list of items needed to meet this, um, the requirements. And it is a very long, long list. Is that it? <laughs> yes, this one. Okay. So I had to read, just to be honest, I had to read through this section several times because this is a long list of things to 
be able to meet. So um, is there something that you can think off the top of your head that if we sat and waited and said, hey, let's let the perfect thing come along that would meet all of these, what would that be? Well, I think there are things under the existing zoning that um, could fit with the site today. Um, we find that the research technology district is very active in development now. And uh, there are light intensity manufacturing is allowed on this site. Um, office showroom warehouse is allowed on that, this site. And we see a lot of that activity um, within the Plano Parkway corridor. Also within the 75 corridor moving north, um, we do see other mixed use developments that more closely follow the redevelopment and growth management policy because of their phasing requirements, such as Assembly Park um, being, being one example of how the it's more closely following these guidelines with regard to the percentage of retail and commercial development. Okay, my last question is on some of these that say partially meets. Are there any things that either you suggested or things that you think that they could do to get them over the hump to these meet? Or are, are we just stuck where we are that with this plan, we're not gonna get closer to meeting these items? I think that um, we've had a lot of discussion on this site. I mean, this is the really uh, at least third hearing that we had at PNZ because they you know, we had a prior zoning case. Um, we had a full hearing at PNZ that ended up in tabling. So there's been a lot of discussion and we've, the applicant has been really great at working with us to add pieces to this um, where they were willing to. So the areas that I think um, that we have discussed are really the proportions of commercial to residential development because the commitment of 70,000 square feet of commercial um, staff has consistently found that kind of light um, related to the amount of residential that's being developed on the site and especially the phasing. Um, some of those that did improve over time, it improved because it changed at the Planning and Zoning Commission, but still the um, I think the 500 units and 33 units of townhouse um, for a future 70,000 square feet of what could be a hotel because it's just strictly non-residential. Um, I'm not sure that really meets the community's land use goals. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Christina. <clears throat> and I apologize, my uh, agenda questions actually never left my drafts, so I'm sorry. Um, I inferred that in the mix of uses in the report, uh, this was talking about the mix of uses within this specific site. The, um, the designation in the comprehensive plan for um, uh, the expressway corridor indicates that zero to 2% should be for housing overall. Um, I didn't see, unless I overlooked it in the report here, um, the basically the line that I usually see in uh, a report on zoning that shows the current uh, mix in the expressway corridor designation. Do you happen to know that? Or can you point me to the page if it's there and I overlooked it? We can look at that. I do wanna say that there, there is a special provision for the US 75 corridor that's up to 12% housing, and so that's why that number okay. is, is a little different than you see in the other expressway corridor areas. I'm gonna see if um, uh, Donna can help me out and look that up. Okay. So we'll, we'll get back to you with that number. Thank you. I, I would suggest that on page, uh, it's gonna be 340. Um, there, the housing number does say the proposal is 11.9%, which is plus 1.3%. Okay. So that gives you a relative amount okay. of change. Sure. Thank you. Councilman Horn. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, and thank you, Ms. Day, for the presentation. Uh, can you go to slide 79, please? Certainly. Thank you. During the last PNZ meeting, when this was uh, rejected four to three, there seemed to be some hesitancy 
uh, on the voting of that because I think there was some confusion about EH1, EHA1 and EHA2. The applicant is proposing to place all the residential property right now in the EH1 area. Is that correct? That is correct. Whereas if you look immediately to the east, you'll see the R190 apartment complex, which is about 95 to 98% occupied, which lies solely in the EH2 area, okay? I went by the visit there Saturday to talk to the, uh, uh, the office managers, but guess what? They were having a pool party. So they were, uh, <laughs> they were not kind to re readily meet with me, but it didn't seem like the noise wasn't really bothering them at that time. I guess, though, I did interview several of the, of the residents as they were walking through that area just to see the first focal question, does the noise bother you? And I, I kind of got a mixed response. Some were upset about the noise from the train, more so from 190 because, you know, the red line goes right by there. Uh, the others, they work from home. They really weren't bothered by the noise. So... I think that when we look at this particular site and the hesitancy of PNZ, who are, I, I do not question them beyond, uh, they are very solid, but the hesitancy of the vote going the way it did, I think they didn't consider that when you looked at the noise aspect of this, the applicant did everything he could to place the residential area into a less rigorous, if you will, uh, noise uh, area. And whereas you look directly to the east, you see an apartment complex is 98% full. It's even higher, higher noise levels. So those are really kind of the, 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 the issue I had here. I, I must, again, iterate to, the, to our, our councilman that the, the comprehensive plan is a guideline, okay? And we have to understand that, again, on this particular site, it almost meets one of the core values which is that it's critical to the success factor of residential and commercial economic vitality. This spot we recognize is in a key location that is vital for, for Plano. And we all like to see something there. But I think if, I'm just concerned if we turn this down, how long would it remain vacant? And, and the applicant is proposing a really good viable alternative with regards to mixed use of housing plus office space, plus open air space, that they're trying everything they can to be within compliance. And the only thing holding it up, I think, really is the EHA numbers. And I think we have to look at what happened to, to the east, also what looked on the tollway up at uh, Legacy West. We approved a, a, a unit there that's above the highway that's gonna be residential, and it has an EH1, EH2 area. So I think we have to consider all that when we look at the redevelopment. But that's my point. Oh, I have an app a question for the applicant when we get down to that. Yeah, let me, uh, Julie, you have a question? Okay. Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, since um, Council Member Horn brought up the environmental impact study and the noise, that was a, a lot of discussion during the PNC meeting. It, it sounded like there was a lot of discussion about the noise levels outside of the buildings, the residential buildings, as well as inside. And I just want to make sure I understood correctly. Do we not have any any goal that we're shooting for for interior noise levels that that would put them? Go ahead. Right in the EHA study that we did, we found that uh, the current building code tends to mitigate if you have the outdoor noise at 65. Um, then it generally with current building codes, you're going to mitigate to the 45, which is also the HUD standard. So we didn't, I'm going to say further complicate the process by including an additional standard. We thought if people can meet the 65 outdoor with current building codes, you're going to get to the uh, recommendation that we would have had anyway on interior noise. But was it correct? Am I correct in my understanding that the, <clears throat> the noise level was actually at that 45 inside the buildings? Or is this a question for the applicant? Um, it, are you saying it was, I, I'm sorry, I didn't totally. I was a little follow. confused during the, the PNZ because it was my understanding that the noise level inside the building was measuring below 45, but 
they're they're proposing as part of their plan development stipulations to measure that and to mitigate to that level okay but we're not measuring by interior levels we're only measuring by we have sort of that's sort of a secondary effect, unstated effect that you have to read the whole report to find that out okay okay thank you that yes all right <clears throat> go ahead uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you for that presentation, Christina, and for your time earlier today. Um, am I correct in understanding that the light manufacturing use that you alluded to would be allowed by right under the current zoning? It is allowed within the corridor commercial zoning district. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, okay. Christina. Thank you. We'll open the public hearing. Um, we have the applicants uh, registered to speak, so go ahead, Lisa. Brian Wolf. Good evening, Mayor and uh, Council Members. My name is Brian Wolf. My address is 4403 North Central Expressway. I'm a partner at Bay West Development and head of our Dallas office. Excited to be here tonight to show you our plans to revitalize this property and kickstart the economic development in this entire neighborhood in East Plano. We've been working on this plan now for over three years. In that time, we've been governed by three separate comprehensive plans. We bought the property under the assumption of the Plano Tomorrow Plan. That was then rescinded, and we were governed by the 1986 Interim Plan. And now we're uh, under the updated Comprehensive Plan 2021. As many of you know, we've submitted a plan two years ago under the Interim Plan. We decided to withdraw that plan and wait for the updated Comp Plan to be completed. Over the past two years, we took a deep dive into the comp plan and had long conversations with all of our neighbors. We went back to the drawing board and made significant changes to our plan. Some of those changes include adding the 1.4 acre Plaza Green, providing a diversity of housing types with the addition of townhome units, and putting together a detailed phasing plan that front loads public benefits and ensures commercial gets built at an appropriate time. And, and finally, we decreased the overall residential unit count by over 330 units. It's been a long road, but we think this development now best represents the needs of this particular neighborhood and best completes the existing mixed-use TOD nature of the area. Oh. Sorry, is our PowerPoint? Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the property closed about two and a half years ago. Yep. No, no. I mean, when did Fry's close? The fr sorry, the Fry's property, the Fry's Electronics store closed about two and a half years ago. Seems like it was longer than that. They, <laughs> they were going the way of the dinosaur long before that, as many of you know. <laughs> But I, do you mind if we? No, not at all. Well, well, while we're waiting, yeah. so, so it doesn't sound so silent here, um, I, I, I would assume probably most of us have, have watched, you know, the PNZ and, and, and great presentation. It looks like, you know, the quality of the, the build that you're talking about is would be very, very nice. Thank you. Uh, while we're waiting to, to hear some of that again, yeah. Uh, what, what have you seen anything that you would like to modify or something you think maybe wasn't said? during that meeting that would be helpful for us to know because it's some of the things that as uh, Mayor Pro Tem had asked on that list there or you know I, I don't know how you're going to overcome those they're pretty significant but you do have some good things on the other side so That's what, right. do you, what do you see maybe that wasn't said that would could tip that balance over to more favorability yeah to us look there were two main issues coming out of PNZ one is what I think is still a confusion about the EHA policy. And, you know, we've tried from the very beginning, we asked who, you know, who the city did uh, the EHA study in the first place. We hired them as our consultant. We've hired, we've, you know, they've been 
with us every step of the way for the past three years. Um, and so to us, there's still some confusion about us not meeting that because it's been our intention the entire time that we've been meeting that and every decision we've made along the way was to do that. Um, so, uh, and then the second part is there's obviously a lot of discussion about this site um, being reserved for future kind of economic development opportunities. Um, and I think what, from my perspective, you know, Plano's the, the city of excellent. Why can't Plano have its cake and eat it too? Let's start the revitalization of this area. It's not like we're getting rid of all of the commercial whatsoever. We've presented what we believe today, once we have the Plaza Green and some vibrancy added to that place, what's most economical today to get going, which is our 124,000 square foot office building and hotel. But it's gonna be, three or four or five years before phase one gets fully completed where we have time to continue that economic development for that site. And we still have, it'll still be over five acres of space that we could use to put a corporate headquarters if it needs that space. You know, there is a ton of visibility. There's some difficulties just from an access perspective, but we're not giving up on the possibility that this site can be used for economic development specifically. Um, and so I think that gets lost sometimes mm -hmm. in the discussion of, of phasing and, and what we're doing. So um, those to me are the, the two kind right. of biggest what, issues. One other thing I'm thinking about, I think it's one of the, uh, recent projects, I think Christina had mentioned that it's not too far from there on their side of the Aura yeah. uh, uh, apartment uh, complex there. Uh, a good thing that they had come back with and improved was the air filtration system for, for the multifamily. I, I, I don't think I ever saw anything in your presentation. What what MERV capability are, are you looking at with your filtration for the, for the multifamily? So the HMMH study that was originally done for the city uh, states that uh, air pollutants are mitigated beyond, I believe it's 300 feet from the expressway. We're all, we're outside uh, 435 foot setbacks from the expressway. So from the consultant's perspective, there's nothing else additionally we, we needed to do. From the first PNZ meeting this round to the second one, we said, okay, we understand that that was your position. Is there anything we can do? So we added uh, air filtration um, standards within our PD stipulations to just go above and beyond that. And that's the location of the ducts, which way they're pointed, stuff like that. And so- What, what fil are you using? Because eight it's, is generally a standard. It's just a standard. And the eight. other went to, uh, Christine wasn't, uh, what, didn't they move up to a- I think so, I think, so I think Jay Place moved up to eight, if I'm not correct, from nothing, if I remember yeah. correctly. I don't remember exactly. I'm sorry. Okay. Anyway, the so that, biggest that was difference was they this, were that you might might have done that was overlooked at the presentation uh, as far as trying to uh, assuage some of the uh, the health, you know, put, let's say potential health concerns that you know that Councilman you know Horn was uh, was talking about uh, as well. Uh, so good. The 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 last thing I'd ask you here. <laughs> Uh, and, and I don't remember the number offhand when, you, when this, let's say, this project were to be approved and were to be built. Yep. The the end valuation it was what like forty eight million dollars plus or, plus or minus uh, in improvements or. I think it would be fairly significantly more than that at full build out. I don't have the exact number off the top. Okay, of my head. so it, it, it would be in excess of the forty seven plus or minus million dollars yeah. in improvements to the property. Yes, okay. absolutely. Great. Thanks, yep. Brian. Yeah. Do we have his presentation ready to roll? So forth? Still I think they <laughs> restarted it, which is always an excellent <laughs> thing that I do all the time. Mayor Pro Tem. Right, so uh, Christina mentioned one of the, I guess, hurdles, hangups is the 70,000 square feet of retail. Uh, in your opinion, since this is probably your area of expertise, do you think that this area of town or given uh, the nature of the area and Collin Creek Mall developing, do you think that the market conditions that it can handle the amount of retail that's being asked for successfully? Yeah, so just to be clear, it's not retail specifically, it's commercial in general. Okay. The, uh, the 70,000 square feet where that number came from was what we've been presenting is, let us build phase one, let us provide the park as a public benefit um, 
in lieu effectively of commercial as phase one to kind of kickstart this area, create a center of the universe in this area. Um, and then we'll hold off, we kind of self-imposed a restriction on the rest of the residential to either the hotel or the office building. The office building as we've currently designed it, which again, if the market changes in the next couple of years, it only behooves us to go more, right? So um, we just tried to program it for what we believe is, is best today in this exact moment. Um, but the 70,000 square feet comes from, that's the square footage of the hotel, which was the smaller of the two. So we said, if we're able to, to build commercial, whether it's the office or the hotel, then would you allow us to build the remainder of the residential on the site? So that's where the 70,000 square feet comes from. In today's exact market, doing nothing to the site. We, I mean, we've had the property, we've been talking to, you know, office, potential office users over the last three years, there's no demand, right? And there's, there's still 1.8 million square feet of undevelopable office space at City Line. There's no practical reason why someone would come to this location versus that location today because they have built out those amenities, they've built out those that housing. Um, and so not only do we, would we have to recover in the current office demand market that we're in today, um, you have to have that uh, space get filled up in, in our beliefs and in all, you know the office leasing brokers that we've talked to. Um, State Farm just put 400,000 square feet on the sublease market, they downsized um, at that city line, so that space would would have to get filled. So there's a, in our opinion, a long way before a solo commercial only development on this site would happen. So in our opinion, let's do something to create that there, there. Let's build something unique like a park. Um, a, can, you can imagine a 125,000 square foot user that has access to a 1.4 acre park for its tenants is a very, we had to create something unique that would allow our site to, to drive additional demand. Looks like you're up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I. Okay. There you go. All right. Uh, so, like I was saying, we have the unique opportunity here to transform this underperforming commercial area into a vibrant economic district in East Plano. Our goal here was to fill the gap of the already existing mixed-use neighborhood and apply the comprehensive plan to guide that development. We wanted to promote a sense of place by incorporating a lively, usable open space with the publicly accessible Plaza Green. We wanted to use the highest design standards in the city to provide a timeless design and attract high wage employment. We want to provide multiple types of housing, which will allow current and future residents in Plano the ability to change housing types as they enter new stages in life. And we want to use, we want to utilize our close proximity to the City Line Dart Station for a, D, a vibrant TOD district. And finally, it was important for us to de develop this plan with the support of all of our neighbors. Uh, I thought it would be helpful to start by uh, quickly showing what the existing property looks like today. This is a view of the property from Plano Parkway. This is an aerial of the property looking north. This is an aerial of the property looking south. You can see here the city line development with State Farm, Whole Foods, and Dart Station across the highway. When we first started looking at this property, our thesis was, why can't we simply draft off the success of City Line and bring that same vibrancy to East Plano? They proved out the concept of economic success if you bring a concentration of people around the DART station. Sorry, it's not letting me change slides here. was working. We had to get Miss Two, otherwise she's not here. And I don't know if she can even see this. Hi, um, just to let you know that whatever uh, slides that um, Mr. Wolf was presenting, um, it, it never showed up on Zoom. But you know, I, I've seen it before, so I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Maria. Thank you. Yeah. I'm not sure how to get a power or a PDF to go. It, it was working. 
Oh, there we go. There we go. Uh, so our property is less than a half mile from the DART station. It's about an eight-minute walk to the platform. We see residents of the property hopping on the train to grab dinner or drinks in downtown Plano, or visitors and customers of the hotel and office having easy access to DFW once the Silver Line is complete. When we started thinking about site planning for the site, it was important for us to look at all the neighboring uses. The blue represents office and flex uses. The red represents retail and the yellow represents residential. As you can see, this is already a mixed-use neighborhood today. What we wanted to do was simply fill in the gap at the center of this neighborhood. And after many iter iterations, this is what we have come up with. 124,000 square foot office building and a 100 key hotel on the southern end of the site, closest to the highway, a 1.4 acre plaza green at the center, 33 townhomes situated along the main street and flanking the plaza green, and two mid-rise residential buildings with about 250 units each closest to Plano Parkway. Here's the first phase of the project. Unfortunately, like I mentioned a second ago, due to the unperforming commercial nature of this area today, there just isn't any demand to include new commercial as part of phase one. So instead, we're proposing including the public benefit of a 1.4 acre plaza green as part of phase one. That will drive additional demand to the adjacent existing office building just to our west and provide a centerpiece for this entire neighborhood. We're then restricting any future residential until we obtain a certificate of occupancy on either the hotel or the office building, ensuring that commercial gets built in the second phase. And this is a visual of what it would look like from Plano Parkway, looking down the main street through the center of the site. You have the apartments on the left, the townhomes in the center, and the office building at the distance. And this is the office building. The design is meant to spill out into the Plaza Green to activate that space, not only at night for the residents, but also throughout the day for the tenants of the office building and the adjacent office building. One of the key components of this project was to focus on the quality of the development. We asked staff what the highest design standards in the city of Plano are, and we incorporated all of those into the PD stipulations. We set the highest design standards for building materials. We maximized the number of outdoor spaces. We set the facade standards for all of our parking structures. We also increased the setbacks to protect against noise and air quality. We made much larger landscape edges, especially compared to our neighbors. And finally, we built this incredible amount of open space anchored by our 1.4 acre publicly accessible plaza green. Why did we do all this? We needed to create commercial demand in this location by building vibrancy and delivering to the market something so unique they can't find it anywhere else. How do we do that? One, through exceptional design, two, through a concentration, uh, high concentration of people, and three, with a unique amenity. Our focus was on driving economic development opportunity not only for our site, but for the neighborhood as a whole, which already has built commercial space and has been unable to drive demand and economic growth. I've personally spoken with every one of our neighbors, and we've been incredibly lucky to have full support. Our entire neighborhood is asking you to help give us a fighting chance with this development. That includes the owner of the Aura 190 apartment complex next to us, which our added residential would be direct competitors of. They understand the importance of how our project can transform this neighborhood. The retail owner north of us across Plano Parkway said of our project, quote, most importantly, it will add foot traffic and vibrancy to our existing and future businesses and retail tenants in the area. The owner of the Central 500 office building said, quote, this plaza green would be a great amenity for our tenants and drive additional demand to the area. So again, we're encouraging you to look at the economic development opportunity, not just of our site, but this neighborhood as a whole when making this decision. But we also had RC Elko, a leading economic consultant, look at exactly what economic benefit this project would bring to the city of Plano. Our project is expected to generate almost $19 million of incremental retail spending. If 75% of that spending stays within the city of Plano, like the report suggests, that's almost $300,000 of new sales tax to the city of Plano per year. They also did a study of the projected hotel occupancy tax, which is expected to generate about $200,000 per year. So this development on its own could generate close to half a million dollars per year of incremental tax revenue to the city of Plano. 
Uh, housing. I know staff had mentioned in their report that they believe that there's already too much housing in this area, referencing a report done five years ago in 2018. The 2021 comprehensive plan actually has a dashboard that calculates the potential new housing in our area. Our area shows current capacity for 829 new multifamily units and 87 new attached or de detached single family units. Additionally, we commissioned a residential study done by the Concord Group, which we had shared with staff. That report states that our competitive market area, taken into account the Collin Creek Mall redevelopment, would be undersupplied by over 3,400 units over the next five years. But as part of our redesign process, we spent a lot of time talking to the surrounding community and neighbors and doing a deep dive into the comprehensive plan. One cop common topic that kept coming up was that there are really only two types of housing in the city of Plano, one single family homes and two apartments. So it was important for us in the redesign to provide a diversity of housing types. We decreased the number of apartments by over 330 units from our initial application and added the single family attached residences. The addition of these townhomes allows current and future residences the ability to change housing types as they enter new stages of life. And as you can see, this allowed for the housing inventory and the comprehensive plan to actually go from out of compliance today to into compliance with our project. But we believe the real centerpiece of this project is the 1.4 acre publicly accessible Plaza Green. This amenity will anchor the entire neighborhood and be a place for all to enjoy. We worked with the adjacent office owner to provide direct connection to the Plaza Green for their tenants and their employees. As I'm sure you know, this section of East Plano has very limited green space. We committed to building this Plaza Green immediately as part of phase one to bring a boost to the entire neighborhood and be a huge public benefit in place of the commercial, which is just not viable right now. And from a city planning perspective, we're transforming this concrete surface parking lot into this beautiful open space. Uh, the next thing I wanted to discuss really quickly uh, was our EHA site analysis. Like I mentioned a second ago, when we bought the property, we knew it was subject to the EHA, and we wanted to make sure we were in compliance from the beginning. So we asked the city who they used to develop the EHA standards and if we could use them to ensure that we stayed in compliance. So we hired HMMH, and they've been analyzing all of our various iterations over the years. And the, from the beginning, we've kept all of our residential units outside of EHA 2, where that use is generally inappropriate, and entirely within EHA 1, where that use is appropriate, so long as we completed an EHA site analysis by an industry expert and implemented all of their recommended mitigations per the policy. So that's exactly what we did. We implemented all of the HMMH recommendations, including setbacks, balcony restrictions, interior noise levels, among other items. And HMMH concluded that our mitigations were consistent with the various mitigation methods in the EHA policy and that our residents are not expected to experience higher concentrations of highway-based air pollutants. There have been other residential cases uh, brought under this comp plan and subject to the same EHA policy that had higher exterior noise levels and had the same or less mitigations to what we have included that staff in the building inspection department determined met the policy and kept the residents safe from the impacts of the expressway. We're simply asking to be treated in the same manner. Now the comprehensive plan, which Christina went through a bit, uh, our, pro our property is designated as expressway corridor in the updated comp plan. It has three main priorities, the redevelopment of the US 75 corridor, protecting land uses in the EHA, and utilizing residential for the redevelopment of underperforming commercial areas. This plan achieves all three of those expressway corridor priorities. This is a chart of the desirable character defining elements. Again, we're meeting all of these elements. This is a chart of the recommended mix of uses in the expressway corridor dashboard. Uh, again, we're meeting all of these numbers. And now we get into the applicable policy actions of the comp plan. The first is a land use policy action four, which calls for revitalization of underperforming retail, which we are doing. The next is LU5, which ensures residential adjacency standards. Our project is similar height and scale to the surrounding neighborhood. Third is TOD policy five, which encourages new development within a half mile of the rail station. Next is TOD four, which describes using structured parking to increase opportunity for more open space, which we've done. Fifth is redevelopment and growth management policy action one, which talks about consistency with the future land use maps and dashboards, all of which we meet. Six is RGM4, which is about providing sufficient open space. 
Next is RGM5, which we only partially meet. As I'm sure you are all aware, RGM5, and specifically A and B, was probably the most controversial policy action in the adoption of the comprehensive plan. As I mentioned during the comprehensive plan hearings, underperforming commercial areas such as this need the residential to stimulate demand and economic activity in the area, just as the comp plan states in our land use designation. So while this policy may make sense in some areas on the western side of the city, legacy, some others, it, doesn't, it just doesn't work here. Luckily, the comp plan allows you to use findings to deviate from that policy where it makes sense. We ask you to look at our project in the context of the entire neighborhood. The development never pierces the minimum 33% non-residential square footage in any phase and totals 51% residential at full build out. Again, that's looking at the neighborhood as a whole. And then finally, we're building our green space concurrent with the first phase as uh, stated in section C. For RGM aid, our project is consistent with the future land use maps and dashboards and we're providing diversity of housing types uh, and within a half mile of the DART station. The last two policy actions are on the re revitalization of retail shopping centers. Our retail corner is certainly a prime candidate for redevelopment, and we are certainly including active open space and green space. So while we meet every aspect of the comprehensive plan, except that two thirds of a single policy action, including all the expressway corridor priorities, all the future land use mixes and numbers, we believe that this proposal meets the intention and guiding principles of the comprehensive plan. We believe it meets the needs of this neighborhood, and we believe it goes above and beyond from a design, green space, and quality perspective compared to anything in Plano. We have a proposed set of findings that I'm happy to walk you through during the Q&A portion if you'd like, uh, but what I would encourage you today, tonight to do is to see what every single one of our neighbors sees. And that's the view from Plano Parkway going from this to this. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Next. Do you have a question? Okay. Go ahead. Hold up just a second. So the comment that Christina made earlier about um, the housing and the way it being shaped in row and it not yeah. making a good neighborhood. Um, what are your thoughts on that and the feeling that it can't be, um, I guess, shaped better? To yeah, there was a lot that. of discussion back and forth with me and Christina on this and with our architects, to be completely honest. Um, and we, along with our architects, felt that the placement of these single family homes was really important to the success of them. What we didn't want is them to be kind of isolated in one area or another of the project. And we thought that the best way to do that was to center them around the main artery as kind of a focal point. The, the other really important part of, of it is, again, we wanted them to feel a part of this TOD community. And where we place them, everybody living in the apartments has to walk by them to get to uh, the open green space, which we expect everyone to use. So it kind of creates that interaction between the apartment tenants, uh, residents, as well as the single family tenants. And our architects and us thought that that was just the best from a, from a placemaking perspective. So do you have, maybe I didn't see it, a picture on here of what that, where they're placed or yep. which ones they were, um, Sorry, I gotta go back to the beginning. Uh, so no, I'm sorry, I meant a rendering, I guess. The oh. renderings were all of the multifamily, right? Uh, no. So you can see them in the park picture. So okay. they're the, oh, they're the kind of right white. There. They're, they're, okay. they're of slightly okay. smaller scale. So I it's, see. they're three story townhomes and it's a five story apartment behind it. Okay, yeah, so they're, they're right there and in front of the park. They're fronting okay, the plaza okay. green. So we wanted the owners of that to kind of have open, sp to direct access to that open space. As you know, in today's market with where interest rates have gone in the last couple of years, single family is, has been a lot tougher than multifamily has. And so we wanted to make sure that if we're providing these single family homes that they're able to be successful. Um, and we thought that that was the location that they'd be most successful. Um, do you want to, Bill, do you want to? Go 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council. Uh, uh, Bill Dahls from 2323 Ross Avenue. I'll be brief. Um, as many of you know, I've been coming out to plan on doing development work out here for over 30 years, and I think it's commendable how Brian's worked with the city staff to accommodate some of the uh, suggestions and, and changes, for example, the phasing and some of the other uh, suggestions made. So uh, uh, don't see it very often, but it was good to see it this, this time around. I'm trying to provide an extremely high quality project. And this is a really good project for the property. I know there's been some discussion about, well, maybe we should wait for another land use to come by. It's better. I, you know, we, we were coming out of a, of a market that's was a pretty good commercial market and nothing developed. You know, we all know that the figures on office development, we all know the figures on commercial and retail development. Uh, not that we should take a development just because it's a uh, last resort, but because it's a good development for the city, it is a good development for this area. And I think it is consistent with the guiding principles because when taken as a whole, and that's what we're, we're supposed to do, taken as a whole, this plan does conform and does, does further the, the principles of the, of the plan. For example, the revitalization of an underperforming retail area, reinvestment of an area, uh, TOD. You know, this is one site in Plano where we have three DART stations, three DART lines. You know, the, I don't know if not, y'all are familiar with that, but it's, it's a very unique site as far as that goes. And these folks who live here will have that, that, that benefit. Um, again, as, as far as thoroughfares, transportation, great access. But, uh, and, and again, it's, um, it's beneficial to the surrounding property owners as well because it will be a shot in the arm. It will be a, a, a reinvestment in this area to make this, a, you know, nothing else, you know, the aesthetics. Also, to promote and bring in more redevelopment and more activity in the area. So, for those reasons, we think that it is consistent with the guiding principles and that it is beneficial to the surrounding properties. It does, you know, conform to the bicycle transportation plan. Uh, as we said, partially the downtown vision and strategy, uh, but I think there are reasons why we can't conform completely because of the, the configuration of the property. The mix of residential uses is, is also, as, as was previously discussed, and again, I think the, the transit-oriented development policy is, is very important in this development, and we respectfully request your approval of the Sony case. Thank you. Thank you. Brian, Brian Moore. Okay. All right. With that, I'll close the public hearing. Confine the comments to the council. Okay. Well, you can you can ask them. Can I throw back. a technical question, Brian? Is anybody from HMMH here to talk about the noise modeling? Not today. Okay. Just maybe you know the answer. When I'm looking at the figures that were, came back on the drawings, uh, well, first of all, let me ask this. They, met, they did their modeling on the annual average daily traffic modeling on for, for 2040. Correct. Would it be a safe presumption with the rise of EVs that the road noise possibly would go down in 2040? So, my, again, I'm not an uh, uh, acoustics assuming. expert. My understanding from the modeling perspective is that we took measurements today. They grow that to get to 2040. Whether EV is factored into that, I would be surprised if it is. I've never seen that that has factored into it, but, um, but they are a grown number from where today's numbers are. Okay. So when I looked at the sampling uh, on page, uh, well, on page two, uh, page 377 of the data, I mean, I got into the nut of this thing. <laughs> It had a table locations M1 through M4, and it showed the data that was presented. But on your figure, it showed short-term sampling one, two, and three, and long-term sampling as one. And I'm not sure how it correlated to that table, if it indeed did. Because a long-term measurement, I understood, was over a 12-hour period yep. or 24-hour period, and the short-term were shorter in increments. Is that correct? Yeah, so my understanding though is that the, the measurements taken at the time of the beginning of this test is just to confirm that the overall assumptions in the model are good, right? So the numbers in the model don't change based on the sampling that was taken. If they're within a delta of what the model shows, uh, then they take the model for as is. Okay, so then when they're back there and they apply the model to the outside of your buildings, 
And they took it from those three distinct, me four distinct measuring points, and I'm still trying to figure out how that correlates to the model. When you look on the first floor of this, particularly on your high rise or mid rise, that they were first floor, they were under the 65 dB. And as you went up, it got, as you went up in height, that, it of course went higher. That's correct. And then when you were on the first floor of the uh, single family attached, they were right at the borderline. Yes. So, so that was the case there. And then they measured it on the third floor. Are you proposing you're going to put balconies on the third floor? No, we actually specifically put a restriction within our PD stipulations that anywhere that the model shows that it's above 65 dBA, we will not put any balconies. Okay. So there will be no, I know it's measured on the outdoor space, but there's no outdoor space on the exterior of those buildings where it shows that it's over 65 dB. Okay, so then the last question I have actually has to deal with particulates. And um, uh, was there any high volume particulate sampling taken on this site? No. So we don't, you know, we're just speculating that there's going to be dust, uh, dust borne contamination without knowing the quanti quantifiable amount that would come from 190 coming from 75 and coming from the construction of Plano Parkway, which seems to go forever. <laughs> but uh, my point being is we don't have that data. There's no data. It's, from my understanding, very diff difficult to get and is not uh, applied as part of the EHA policy. Okay, uh, other than to state that beyond the 300 feet that the particulate matter goes away, such we put the 435 That's why you have 435 foot setback versus the 300 foot. Correct. Okay, great. That's all I have. Thank you. Thanks. Any questions for the applicant? Thanks, Brian. Okay. Any any thoughts, any comments, please? This is Maria too, Mayor. Hi, Maria. I'm sorry, I didn't see you. Go ahead. No, I, sure. Um, I, I, I'm really torn on this project because I really do like um, what is being proposed. However, I do understand that this is an appeal from the planning and zoning. In other words, um, we would need to have a super majority in order for it to pass. Um, I, I, I would like, for, Mayor, for you to sort of get an idea of what um, we're looking at. Um, if, you know, if we're at a point where we are unable to come to a, um, a decision, um, then I want some options to be available instead of having this plan just completely dissipate it, um, possibly have the planning and zoning look at it again. I do understand the planning and zoning um, at the time of this, um, um, when this went through, there were only seven of them and there were a lot of discussions and there was a lot of um, misunderstandings, I believe, at the time of discussion. So um, with that, Mayor, I'm just gonna- I'm just Okay. Gonna, Leave it. I appreciate it. Um, go ahead, Mayor Pro Tem. I'll, I'll just share how what, what I think about it. You know, one of the main reasons that I wanted to run for council was because I've lived here my whole life and I wanted to make sure <laughs> for 40 years <laughs> I've lived here my whole life and I wanted to make sure that Plano is a vibrant city for all the people that come after me. And so it pains me to see a building like this sitting there empty and vacant for two and a half years and to think that it will keep sitting there vacant. So um, I also I also look at some of these policies and I know we, uh, many of us on here voted for the comprehensive plan, but in our current market, I think it's unrealistic to think that we're gonna require every property that we want revitalized to have 50% of non-residential just in this market if we want things revitalized. So uh, to me, I think this is one that makes sense for us to um, pass and to help revitalize this area. And so I'm in support of it and I'll make a motion for approval. Mr. Mayor. And I will second. Okay, all right. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Gassman Horn. Uh, thank you. Um, I looked at this property, went by the property, and um, yes, you can hear the road noise, but you can also hear the road noise coming off of Plano Parkway. And I, I do have, 
Well, I, I do believe in environmental health, and I think where um, our petitioner is looking to amend that through the way they're going to do the construction, uh, the outside noise, we allowed that in the R190, though that was probably under a previous plan before we had our EHA numbers. So I think it's uh, uh, grossly unfair that we would uh, uh, not approve this because we revised our comprehensive plan, to be honest with you. And likewise, when we looked at uh, Legacy West development, we uh, approved a high-rise construction there that was in an EH2 area. So this revitalization, if they take into partnership with the existing office building to the west, will meet the occupancy goals that we were looking for with regards to percentage of office space and residential. And with them having that open space there, that one and a half acres, I think that'll be welcoming for the neighbor to, neighborhood. So for those reasons, I'm in favor of uh, pushing this forward. And um, maybe down the line when the office requirements are changed, maybe that'll go from, I guess, the six-story building, maybe go to 12-story. But that's to be a case in the future. But right now, we're faced with this redevelopment, and I would vote in favor of it. Go ahead. Sorry. Thank you, Mayor. Well, I want to, first of all, I had a great meeting with uh, Brian Wolf from the applicant. Uh, we met for an hour and a half. I think I really appreciate your time. Um, th this is a very hard zoning case. I feel torn uh, for many of the reasons that uh, Maria, Deputy Mayor Pro Tem 2, described. Um, unexpectedly so, given the staff recommendation for denial and, and the PNZ recommendation of denial, um, this plan is, is vastly improved from the proposal a couple of years ago uh, that came forward. Uh, the open space, the Plaza Green it is a real plus. The commitment to high design standards is a real plus. Obviously, it's a TOD location. And I do think that when you look at the EHA policy uh, from a mitigation perspective, really we need to be focused about uh, where humans are and where they'll encounter sound. And, and they've, they've mitigated for that, um, you know, looking at, at uh, noise levels indoors. Um, and also, of course, the redevelopment of a, a closed big box retail store is a plus, as the mayor pro tem alluded to. Um, so I, I feel really torn about this, but um, as, as uh, Christina talked about, I, I do just come down thinking that the commercial is, is light uh, compared to the amount of multifamily, and the incongruity is not lost on me that, uh, you know, that if you propose an entirely residential development, RGM-5 does not apply in the comprehensive plan um, such that, uh, you know, there's a chance that we could end up favoring developments that have 0% commercial rather than some commercial. So I hope that we'll be careful not to do that and, and, and not, to, not to favor developments with 0% uh, non-residential development over those that endeavor to have some. Um, nonetheless, even if this was, you know, 0% um, non-residential, you know, I, I, I couldn't get over the idea that um, not every redevelopment in, in the city can or, or should be accomplished with uh, predominantly multifamily redevelopment. This is an area that already has zoning for uh, light manufacturing uses. Um, we could, you know, build on the success of, of, of the growing RT district that's nearby with uh, a high-tech light manufacturing use that I, I think would be very appropriate and beneficial here and, and, and I would hope profitable for, uh, for the developer. Um, you know, and, and, and again, if, as we're looking at all of this retail that needs redevelopment right now, you know, one lesson that we've taken from that is, is that perhaps we shouldn't have approved so much, you know, this is not four corner retail, it's big box retail, but so much four corner and other retail back in the 1980s. The lesson that I would generalize from that is that we don't want to get overweighted on any one land use type and, uh, you know, Right now, I think we're, we're seeing a trend where virtually every redevelopment is being accomplished primarily with, with multifamily, and, and that changes the balance of land uses in the city. The comprehensive plan is really designed to give careful thought to the balance of land uses in the city. And so I, I think 
retaining this for a commercial use, potentially a, a, a light manufacturing or an industrial use, is it would be a positive for the community, and, and I hope it would be a great success for the developer. Clearly, you've put a lot of thought into this, and I, I really appreciate the, the thoughtful uh, proposal here. But I, I can't conclude that, that a change from the, the current zoning uh, to the new zoning would be, would be beneficial to the city. Uh, I'd like to see it stay commercial, and 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 you know, I, I hope that that light manufacturing uh, potential use is viable. So, uh, while it's really, really a close call, much closer than I expected it to be, the applicant's been very persuasive. Clearly, put a lot of thought and effort into this, and I appreciate the attention to quality and detail. But I just can't quite get there, and, and so I'll be voting no tonight. Thanks, Shelby. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I appreciate the concept that the uh, applicant has brought forth, and I appreciate that um, they've worked with the city uh, to accommodate some of the uh, issues here. Um, and I'm sensitive to several things. I'm sensitive to uh, the fact that the land was acquired under the prior comprehensive plan, although it was also acquired under the existing zoning, which would still need to be changed. Um, I'm also sensitive to the fact that the current uh, market probably doesn't support the amount of uh, office space, at least, though there are other forms of commercial um, that would make this viable under the, uh, with less residential or no residential. But the reality is that the dust hasn't settled in terms of commercial space viability from the pandemic. It's still evolving, it's still changing. Um, I'm also mindful of the, the vacancy on this land. Um, I'm very familiar with the area. I spent a lot of money at that fries, not enough to keep them in business, but <clears throat> um, I'm, I'm familiar with the area. And I don't want any part of our city to fall into blight. Um, however, there are some problems where you have the opportunity to fail fast in search of a solution. You can just keep trying things until something's work, something works. Development isn't one of those things. Once it's developed, it's developed. Um, and it's literally set in concrete. Um, and I believe that we do need to take a strategic approach to redevelopment, especially of these cor corners, which are right between two expressways. We only have four in the city that are in the city of Plano and uh, that are right in the crux of those. Those are very special areas, and even if they don't come along for another two and a half years, um, I believe that these should be reserved for something special. It doesn't have to be a unicorn, but I believe there are more options that are um, more complementary to the redevelopment of the downtown area as well as the east side. Um, and while the comprehensive plan is a plan, it's right there in the title, um, as some have characterized, not you, Councilman Horn, but as some have characterized, it's not just a plan. Uh, I know we all take it very seriously, not least because of how it came to be. Uh, not only everything that went into developing the comprehensive plan, but the, all of the angst in the city that led to the development of the new comprehensive plan itself. And so I do take it very seriously. And I don't believe um, well, actually, watching the P&Z footage, uh, I know the EHA uh, weren't the only things um, at issue, though they did consume a lot of uh, discussion. Um, there were other issues, and in the end, um, I, don't, I don't think that residential at all, single-family or multifamily, is appropriate for this corner. Um, I think the, um, the potential for better commercial uses is there, and I don't think it's going to take us 20 years to get at a good um, uh, a, a good concept for it. Uh, maybe even something with the current zoning it doesn't even require rezoning. But um, for that, I uh, and you can probably guess uh, I'm not in support of this project. Though uh, I should reiterate that I do appreciate the plan that the applicant came up with and presented, and the modifications that have been made. I don't want to understate that. Councilman Holmer. Well, unlike Casey, I haven't been here my whole life, but I've been here as long as she has, and I got here as fast as I could in 1981, and I've grown up with Plano, and I also um, am sensitive to the fact that I you know, don't like seeing these blighted areas. Um, 
think it's really unusual to see so much support from neighbors at a development mm -hmm. and to see so, you know, so all the surrounding support, even businesses that theoretically would be in competition um, supporting this. When you look at the land map and who else um, gives support, most of the opposition didn't come from close proximity. I actually received an email tonight from someone, or this, this afternoon, from someone in opposition. And ironically, one of the sentences says, must you, must you all cover up every bit of green space in our city? And this development's actually giving us some green space, which I don't think we would have otherwise, quite honestly. I don't think any commercial developer would come in here and give us one and a half acres of green space. So for, for that, I think it, it's amazing, and I think that speaks to um, really listening to, to, the, to the neighbors and understanding what's important to them and to the to developments nearby and the residents nearby. Um, I did speak to some of the other landowners who are... Um, are really wanting to see um, see all of it um, revitalized, and there's so much retail in that area that's been sitting. I mean, aside from fries, quite honestly, that has been sitting vacant or underutilized for for a long time already. Um, to Council Member Williams' point about the that location being kind of prime with it being at that intersection of these two major highways, I actually feel differently about it. I, I've always thought that was the weirdest intersection to get to. It's very awkward to mm -hmm. turn back into that area. And for that reason, I feel like residential makes more sense back there. Um, so I'm in favor of that. Um, for that reason, the, the uh, noise, actually, let me get to... Um, uh, as we mentioned, the area being blighted, I mean, it, it is attracting crime right now. There's a lot of graffiti every time I go by. I, I see that. It's, um, so that's not obviously uh, favorable. Um, but just what, as a former small brick-and-mortar business owner, I'm, I'm sensitive to the other businesses down there and, and them wanting to see that revitalized. I think that we will benefit from the city line uh, traffic down there. And then I think it's really important what is important about that location is the transit-oriented development. I mean, you've got mass transit there, that uh, public transit that I think people uh, would want to take advantage of. Um, it's one of the main locations that we have in, in Plano that, that people really can take advantage of our public transit. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't, to me there's a cost to waiting for something better to come along. I don't see that being uh, an advantage. I. Um, I think it's going to be a long time before we see see all the empty commercial space that's sitting around and already approved that hasn't even been developed yet um, before mm -hmm. we see that get it filled up. So <clears throat> I, I think there's a real cost to, to waiting. Um, and to Maria's point, I also would have liked to have seen all of the commissioners present at the PNZ um, hearing to hear the discussion um, from the absent member as well as just the interactions there. Um, I also um, feel like we need to reevaluate our, our ordinances for sound. I, I don't think the intention is really being met if we're not looking at noise within, um, within buildings. We're only looking on the outside if no one's going to be living on the outside. So, um, I, and I don't know if, if the city manager can give us some direction or, or, um, or legal, um, but I, I am in favor of this, but I, I also don't want to see um, see this. You know, if we can, we don't get a super majority. I'd hate to to scrap the whole thing. I think it's it's a good opportunity. So, Councilmember Smith. <laughs> Gee, thanks. No pressure here. <laughs> I'll go after you. Oh, good. Right. Uh, I, I have some trepidation. I, I I really like what the applicant has put forward the time and effort and has worked from what I understand with, you know, with our uh, planning staff uh, hand in hand and has really attempted to make uh, the changes to keep this, keep this thing moving forward. Uh, my question earlier about what, what is this going to uh, bring in terms of uh, uh, built out market value for the city, I'm, I'm, very aware of this project, uh, this site has been vacant uh, for 
three years plus or minus. I remember how long, a little bit bigger, but Collin Creek was, let's say, was pretty much a dead dead area too, and, and that almost didn't come together, uh, you know, before it finally did come together. So, I, I'm I like Councilman Homer. I hate to see this go away. Uh, it is going to require a super majority. Uh, what what I maybe this is a Michelle question. What I'd like to pose and make a motion if it's applicable that uh, if this does not receive a supermajority vote on this pass, uh, I'd like to enter a backup motion to remand this back to planning and zoning, give the applicant a, ch a chance to, to make some additional changes because the, the, the one thing that I, I would like to see that I didn't hear uh, was to say, I mentioned one of the other projects, this kind of it was in sort of a similar situation, multifamily. And, and they they did make an effort. They did went, go to an additional expense, and they upped the air filtration, the you know the MERV capability on, on their uh, project. It was it was a, it was a good gesture, and I think it's it's going to pay off. You know, for the residents who live there long term. So that might be one thing to consider. So would that be a feasible proposal to make? Because I, I, again, I hate to see this go away because I, I think the the applicant has has done some really good things, and I do believe they would deliver. A, a, a good product, but I, there, there's just the, those those X's there that it just did not meet, just bother me, and, and I think that needs to be fixed in, in some method to make this thing be a viable project. So I, I would, before we vote, I would make a, a backup motion to remand it. Well, you can, we'll do it if the, the other one fails. Okay, because I just want to be sure that, how, assuming the vote doesn't go super majority, that, uh, that it doesn't just die right here. That good? Okay, great. I'll uh, I'll finish. I I am a whole lot like Mayor Pro Tem and uh, Councilmember Holmer when it comes to you know being around here for a long time and seeing blighted areas that uh, really concern you over over a lengthy period of time. This one is certainly one of those. I like Councilmember Horn. I I walked it a couple of days ago and walked all the way to the to the DART station, and it's just it's just a fabulous opportunity to have employment housing for all of our businesses, whether it be all the way to the R and T or 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 companies that are moving to Plano, all over all over the city, uh, for these people to have such great access to not only the the DART rail, but you know, when you when you start looking at redevelopments, you, you're looking at uh, very difficult projects. N never is a redevelopment exactly as you plan it. There's always going to be uh, variables that you don't know about until you get into it. Uh, I think we've seen that with Collin Creek. I think it's pretty obvious that w when you want to revitalize something that's been there for so long, it, it does require some innovation, creativity, and, and, and I, I really appreciate the design that you put into it. One and a half acres of green space is just unheard of. I mean, that's a lot of green space. And so uh, what, what you see right there is, is a concrete parking lot and a dilapidated building that's been there for a long time. And to know that this opportunity is right here for us, I, I, I appreciate what you've done. I appreciate uh, uh, lowering the density uh, from your initial uh, proposal. And this is just one that is, is a infill redevelopment that can really be something special. And right now, as, as a real estate developer, this has, I have no interest in this to become a commercial office building. Uh, it, it just would not work. The access and egress uh, in, uh, in it really don't work. And so this opportunity seems like a really good one. And um, I know how long you've been working on it, and, and I appreciate that. I appreciate your, your, your patience and diligence through, throughout this um, I, for one, uh, am, am for this proposal, and, and so I, I will vote for it because I do think 
This is the kind of redevelopment we need in areas of, of, of just a blighted development that's been there for too long. And, and I think we're all tired of seeing it. And I don't know that we're going to have, you know, the, the magical prince ride in on the white horse and come up with some amazing commercial development. So uh, I, I am uh, for this. And the fact that we have a motion and a second, uh, we need to vote on this particular item. So we don't have electronics, so I'm going to need you to vote. So. Um, uh, item two has uh, been proposed to pass with a second. All in favor of passing item two, please raise your hand. Okay, that's, that's five. Opposed? Three. Okay. Would you like to make that motion now, Rick? Uh, yes, Mayor. I would uh, make a motion that we uh, remand this uh, project back to uh, planning and zoning uh, for additional reconsideration. I'll second that. Second. Okay. We have a motion and second to uh, uh, send this back to PNZ for hopefully a full uh, commission to, to vote on it. Uh, so we're ready to vote for this. All in favor to send it back to PNZ, please raise your hand. Those opposed? Okay, so motion passes seven to one. Okay, thank you. Item three. Item three, excuse me. Item number three. Consideration of RFP number 2022-373BR for development services software system for a seven-year contract with three one-year city optional renewals to purchase a development services software system through Unisys Corporation in an estimated co total contract amount of $3,625,892 Clarity Cloud Incorporated in an estimated total contract amount of $5,623,542 and Evolve Software in an estimated total contract amount of $1,430,537 for a combined total amount of $10,679,971 and authorizing the city manager to execute all necessary documents. Mayor and Council, actually items three and four go together on this um, for this particular project. And I wanted uh, Roger to be able to, to present this uh, to Council briefly. We get a lot of discussion um, from developers about our processes and efficiencies and things of that nature, how we actually do our work. And this is going to be in a very important tool uh, within our land use and our development group. So Roger has a very brief presentation that we'll get through as quickly as possible, but wanted to, thought, thought this was important for the uh, development community to hear. Good evening, Mayor, Council, City Management. Um, very brief presentation, but Roger has a tendency to talk a lot. So um, thank you for the intro there, Mark. The, um, this is a problem that the city's faced for quite a while around the development services solutions. We've had a lot of focus on it my entire tenure here. And so um, kind of walk you through what we're doing. The, uh, the current system was implemented in 2015. Uh, that system had some implementation issues relative to some of the ways that it was configured, the data migrations and workflows and things of that nature. The system itself is not an extremely robust system that lacks a lot of features, core features, especially advanced features around mobility and um, real-time access to information. The application due to that lack of features has kind of grown organically. So what I mean by that is um, this development staff is a very creative staff. They're always very diligent and focused on meeting the needs of the citizens. So they have found ways around the system to do what they need to do. Um, we estimate up to 65 to 70% of what we're doing is actually done outside of the system through manual processes and things. And that has led to a system that's been very hard to maintain and to expand and to add new capabilities to. So we reached out to the vendor um, 2021, beginning of 2021, to try to remediate some of these issues. We found that uh, they were lacking in their support and their capabilities to meet our needs. 
we continued to work with them for an extensive amount of time. But in parallel to that, we engaged a uh, vendor to work with us to do a gap analysis on what our true needs are from an objective standpoint. So what are our true needs? What capabilities do we have? And what are the implications of not having that? So we engaged a uh, consulting company called Barry Dunn. They did that assessment. And part of that engagement was um, if it was deemed that the system can't meet our needs to move that in from those, that gap analysis and requirements into something that could become an RFP. So we, we moved forward with that. The findings from their assessment was that we needed a very modern, extensible system. We needed that system to be able to streamline our processes and the work that we do internally so that we could be much more efficient, but only for the reason of meeting the needs of the development community. So not only will we be more efficient in what we did, but we'd be much better at meeting the needs of that community. They, a lot of uh, real-time status for all the parties involved was, was, was a deemed a critical component of that, which includes dashboards. Um, we want to have portal capabilities and online payments, and we need that system to be mobile friendly, not just for you know, submissions and things of that nature, but for the inspections. It needs to be able to work on an iPad, a phone, laptop, equally the same, regardless of the form factor that you're dealing with. So we took all of that information and we went into an RFP process. When we came through that RFP process, we looked at nine different uh, vendors. We did a very large search. Nine vendors came back as potential. We did a very extensive review of that, brought it down to three, brought them in for demonstrations, and then determined that this particular suite of vendors met our needs. This is one solution that was proposed as one solution, but it involves three parties. Clarity Cloud, which is a Salesforce platform, a very robust, very extensible platform. And that is gonna be the main engine that does all the development services work. And then Evolve is what does our electronic permitting. And that system is in intricately integrated with Clarity. They're, they're one solution. They each have their workflows, but the workflows are designed to work together. So as we're doing electronic plan reviews, that automatically goes back into the, uh, the Clarity solution and you know exactly where you stand, which enables that real-time status for the staff and for the citizens. And we want this to be one development process not individual departments with stovepipes of processes. So Unisys is the integrator that proposed the solution. They're a consulting company that will do all of the data migrations, all the integrations, and oversee the, the, the configurations and things of that nature. So they will be the, for the developed from the uh, system side, the glue that kind of brings this together. This is a very complex project. It's, I have seven departments on here. It's actually eight plus licensing and perm, uh, alcohol licensing, which makes it nine. Very complex process. It's 27 months is the proposed timeline, and it's all of development services. Um, that's the solution for the software. We're proposing an item, I think it's four, to bring in Barry Dunn. That's the same one that did the gap analysis for us and took us all the way through the selection and contract negotiation. We want to bring them in. First off, they have extensive domain knowledge now of our processes and how we do business and what our development community needs and what our staff needs. So they'll bring that into the project. They also recently implemented this exact same solution. Um, they're finishing it up right now in California at a city the size of 300,000, so very comparable to us. So they're, they're finishing that implementation up now so they know these products and they know the, the pain points, the ins and the outs, and the things that we should watch for. And their, their practice overall has extensive knowledge in the development services and permitting spaces. And so they, will, they are being brought in to partly to supplement my staff because we had numerous enterprise uh, projects going on from a project management and oversight and best practice standpoint, but to the very much larger extent to make sure that we have an objective, accountable change management process here. Um, and as we start looking at implementing this, we're gonna run into a lot of trade-offs because we don't necessarily have one common development process now. We have a, one that's been um, very well massaged to be you know, as seamless as it can be with its stove pipes but they're gonna help us with best practices and continuity of the best processes, best practices internally and best practices for the development community. So they'll keep us honest, they'll help facilitate this and they'll manage the implementation. So as I said, it's a 27 month project, it'll begin in August of 2023. We estimate, that's assuming approval, <laughs> and, and it would wrap up in November of 2025. Um, like I said, part of Barry Dunn's job is to ensure that we stay on that timeline, that we meet this need as fast as we can. The, um, one of the things I want to say about the Barry Dunn contract is, is we've worked extensively with them and other uh, departments to make sure we knew exactly what deliverables we, we were putting in. That contract is um, deliverables based with some um, time and materials support in there as well. We will only 
pull the trigger and execute what we deem necessary for the project as we go along. There's some health checks and things in there that we, if it were going well, we won't have to execute. So um, this is the most we would expect to spend. Uh, the contract with the software piece is 10 year contract. It's seven years with three renewals. And the implementation costs total, total roughly 2.5 million. The maintenance support is 8.1. Our ongoing cost each year would be 880,000 on average. You know, of course, it escalates three to four percent per year, but that's the average across the life of the project. And the, the implementation support from Barry Dunn would be 884,000 for the life of the project. Again, we can control how we spend that. We'll be governed by both a project governance team that's been established, and Elizabeth and Lori are the project sponsors as part of that governance team, and also TSSC, our Technology Services Steering Committee. So that's as brief as Roger can be. Thanks, Roger. Any questions for Roger? Councilmember Smith. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Roger, uh, sounds like great, and I'm all for you know improving our technology for sure. That's one thing that keeps us moving and as successful as we are. Uh, with with this system and what it has access to, do, what it concerns, if any, do you have about potential security holes that this might might create for us? Because you know, with all the news about the ransomware attacks and things, this is can be a good avenue to, to get into our system. Yeah, and actually I skipped that bullet. It's in the presentation about the stability and, and the security of the system. This actually enhances that. Salesforce is a very robust modern platform. Um, and we're talking about going to a much newer, much more um, sophisticated system. Our current system actually has issues with us keeping it current. It isn't, it's not what I call a well-pruned garden. Mm -hmm. And so this will actually enhance our posture, not diminish it. We, we, and we're at more at risk by having information in disparate places outside of the system than we are when you put it into a system and I can put the proper defense and layers of strategy to that. Okay, so it will enhance our posture. Thanks, Roger, appreciate that. Thank you, Roger. Um, I inferred from this that because uh, Barry Dunn helped us identify a lot of the workarounds that we've implemented with TrackIt, um, that they're going to be helping us uh, or advising us at least with uh, the business process re-engineering so that we're not simply configuring the new solution to match our current processes, which were just workarounds to begin with. Yeah, they're not going to be extensively involved in helping us to redesign the processes, but they're there to consult us. Mm -hmm. We've actually started a couple of months ago. Okay. Um, within technology solutions, working with the departments, mapping out the as-is state. Okay. And I was actually asked the question today, why are we focused on as-is instead of 2B? Because my experience has been if you map out the, the happy path 2B, when you start actually configuring the system, you go, oh, yeah, but we forgot about this. Oh, yeah, we forgot about that. Mm -hmm. So starting with that as-is gives us the great foundation of knowing what all we have to account for and what we don't want to account for, and then we start mapping out the 2B. So that process has already started. Um, we're well on the path. We've already done several departments, neighborhood services, and there's several others to the, to the current state. And then the teams are going to be, we've got a very significant, I mean, thanks to Mark and the governance team, across the departments, um, they're leading several, uh, these two leading great efforts to bring them together as a true team. We're forming what's called a core team and an extended team. The core teams are constant throughout, and that team is the one that's going to be taking that as-is state and creating our 2B. And then Barry Dunn will constantly look at that and say, you know, best practice is this, or we saw this in other situations, other cities do this. But on top of that, if we get into some internal battles, they have the objectivity to weigh in and say, okay, I hear all your voices, but y'all aren't really considering this perspective. All right, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> Councilman Riccadella. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, and Roger, thank you so much for that, that great presentation. You know, this sounds like a, a very exciting uh, project to you know really make this uh, an incredibly useful tool for the community and uh, and, and that's fantastic um, in the RFP recap I noticed that uh, Unisys is is I think the second highest priced option and you know in your presentation you talked about many of the great things that Unisys is going to offer without necessarily asking you to go through each of the other vendors or or to you know bash on anybody in in, in specific I'm just wondering what what were some of the things that were not present in some of the lower cost options that, that cause us to say that we need to go with Unisys. And that, again, that's not to say that we you yeah. know, shouldn't you know, get the best for our community. I just want to make sure that, you know, that I understand you know, why this is still the best value, even at the higher price, sure. given you know, higher functionality. Yeah, candidly, this, you know, I have 
experience and background in this, this was not the vendor that I anticipated. I had a vendor in mind when we looked at this. I tried to stay objective and everything. But as we started looking at, um, especially the, uh, the references and things, we noticed that what was lacking with a lot of the other systems was the actual implementation. We were getting, they were getting installs that were going three and four years. And a couple of the people were like, you know, we're having to figure it out on our own now, or we're pulling out, we're looking at another product. And uh, frankly, if you look at the, the track it implementation, while the software wasn't um, what it should be, what went wrong was the implementation. When we did reference checks on Unisys, one of the things that we got was just raving uh, fans. They were like, they made the difference. They brought skill set to this. Um, they, they, their follow through was excellent. We actually do have the integrations that were promised and we do have the workflows configured correctly. So it doesn't do a lot of good to get a great system if you install it and not implement it properly. And Unisys, um, their sole role in this is to ensure that these systems are properly implemented along with the integrations and, and the, the interface and things. Certainly. Well, well, thank you for that. And that certainly helps me to understand why this is still, you know, the best value for the city and its taxpayers, even at a higher price than yes. some of the other options that may be lower priced. But based on what you're saying, sounds like they may not deliver as much value for, for the city. And this is a much more with it being Salesforce platform. It is an extremely highly configurable tool, which is a very good thing, especially for the future extensibility but it also brings much more risk to the implementation. So it's important that we have a good partner to help us through that. Sure, well, thank you, thank you for that great explanation. Council Member Holmer. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Holmer? Sorry. Which one? No. Thank you. I, I was looking at your RFP uh, sheet. It, yeah, I was looking at your RFP sheet and I noticed that Unisys was at 13 million plus, okay? But in what you're up here at your summary, the award amount was $10 million. Um, are we are we approving ten million dollars? Are we approving the thirteen million dollars? That, that the, from my memory, the RFP um, piece is the original price that we scored them on, and then they came back with the best and final offer. So you were able to shave three million off the, yes, from the best and final. Oh, good job. <laughs> that's not me. That's procurement. Motion to approve. Second. Wait. Motion to approve items three and four. Yes, thank you. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Second. I have a motion to second to approve item three and item four. All in favor, raise your hand. Motion passes eight to zero. Thanks, Roger. Thank you. Appreciate it. Without further business, we're adjourned. Goodbye. A pretty healthy competition with Richardson over oh, some yeah. of his businesses.